Okay, welcome everybody to tonight's session of the Thinkers Lounge Live. Tonight I have a very special guest. He is the former Director General of uh, Finas, uh, and he is also currently the advisor of Maxman TV, one of Malaysia's top YouTube channels, uh, ranked at number 52 the last I checked. Uh, yes, Dato Kamil. It's Dato Kamil. So uh, can you just share a little bit more about yourself uh, to our audience, Dato? Well, I think in, in very simple words, I mean, I'm just uh, what I call a, someone who wants to become a filmmaker, but who couldn't become one. So I become the next best thing to be just a film critic. <laughs> to enjoy watching films and all that. So basically, that's it. Well, my background is uh, in finance and accountancy. And uh, that's where the bulk of my career has been in the beginning uh, with uh, Shell, with an oil and gas company. And then after that, uh, it was with the Multimedia Development Corporation. Uh, that was about uh, slightly more interesting because it's uh, not about oil and gas, but about animation, uh, about the technology part of the industry, for want of a better description. And then uh, two years and a bit at uh, Finas, which is about the feature, the world of feature film itself. So lots of um, eye-opening sort of uh, experiences. And at the same time, um, yes, a very fair balance of where we might be going based on whatever it is that has happened before. So, uh, and now on retirement, um, we just advise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, excellent. I mean, uh, of of course, definitely. When you started off introducing yourself as a humble critic, you know that's that's really <laughs> that's a lot more to you. I mean, especially uh, during your time in Finas, you know, uh, uh, I think the creative and film industry here really appreciates how much heart uh, you put into the Malaysian film industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, yeah, so I mean, our, our main topic for today is, of course, uh, The Mandalorian, you know, it's, it's gotten viral on uh, uh, Twitter in Malaysia, on Facebook, everybody's seen that the logo of Finas popping up and saying that there's a 30% uh, cash rebate uh, for the episode of The Mandalorian. And uh, some, some people were saying, oh, you know, uh, is it really necessary to be... Uh, 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 subsidizing the Mandalorian when it's not even filmed here. Uh, so please enlighten us, uh, Dato Kamil, about the uh, Finas's approach. Well, when, when this whole controversy, well, I mean, I call it not so much controversy, when this whole thing blew in the social media, the first thing that came to my mind was uh, why suddenly people realized that there is such a thing as an incentive uh, that has been going on for the last, uh, I believe, last eight years, actually. It has been going on for the last eight years. And why uh, only the Mandalorian was cited, uh, like everybody forgot uh, crazy rich Asians also had that incentive. And uh, even before that, uh, one of the early recipients was a Netflix uh, TV series called uh, Marco Polo. And then in between, um, we also have like um, local productions because remember this incentive is not just meant for overseas it's also meant for local productions so local productions uh, i'm sure everybody must have heard about the film the garden of the evening mist uh, mm. that was based on a book but it was an astro short production yes it had foreign uh, cast and all that and uh, you know some of them and even the director but we are going by the intellectual property, but it is a Malaysian intellectual property based on a book written by a Malaysian. And then we also have Police Evo 2 and 3, who were past recipients of uh, the incentive as well. And um, Ola Bola, which everybody remembers, Ola Bola, that, that football thing. So you see, um, all this have received the film in Malaysia incentives before, but it's only, I think, everybody didn't bother to sit you know, on their, in their, on their seats in the cinema until the film really ends, until the light goes off, uh, to actually see the Finas logo, the film in Malaysia Incentive logo, and so on. But for Mandalorian, for some reason, everyone noticed it. So um, to, to summarize it, uh, 
Mandalorian is not the first because there have been others before before it, except that uh, maybe because Star Wars is popular, so it got um, a large uh, fan base. So maybe that's why people are beginning to realize. But having said that, um, to the comment that uh, why are we subsidizing uh, foreign productions and all that? Well, the thing about Fini we have to understand is uh, in very simple economic terms, it's about bringing in, uh, well, giving out small money you know, that the big money can come in. So if we put it into a slightly more academic uh, perspective, it's a bit like Malaysia already has the supply of talent. Malaysia already has the supply of people who could do wonderful things uh, from the creative industry, be they computer programmers or 3D artists or motion graphics artists uh, or voice actors and so on. But the question is, where would the demand be coming from? Now, if you allow the demand to just surface from the local demand landscape, you will find that most of these talents will not be employed because the local industry uh, seldom would use, you know, this sort of high-end skills. So uh, the whole purpose of the incentives is that you bring in a foreign production, you tell them, how much are you going to spend in Malaysia? And once they have given you a figure, you tell them, okay, after an audit has been carried out, if you actually spend X million, you're going to get 30% of that X back to you as a cash rebate. So that's the pool factor. So that's why companies like, um, like Disney, uh, you know, brought in Mandalorian here because I need to emphasize one more element. In the incentives, one is for the making of a film, a feature film. But that incentive is also there for post-production. There's a reason for post-production and uh, we are not unique in that sense. Australia has this incentive for years already. This is where they would go to a Hollywood production and try to bring just the post-production part to Australia. And that's exactly what we are attempting to do with the Film in Malaysia incentive as well. So you'll find, you know, a million, a hundred million uh, Hollywood production, and they would require post-production work on the film. So we would go there and tell them, look, Malaysia has this 30% incentive, please come here. So it is really a situation of you create, uh, you intervene in the demand generation because Malaysia already has uh, thousands, I think, of graduates since about 2002, graduates in computer animation, visual effects, and so on and so forth. And they are always been on the lookout for jobs because remember, these are very mobile people. If we do not have the jobs here, um, you and I would know that their most favorite destination would be just one little country down south, who are also, you know, if you go to some of their big studios there, you'll find uh, almost, what, 30, 40% are Malaysians. So this is more like a retention interventionist policy as well. And this is why we have said uh, this incentive has never been about giving just money just like that to international productions or to support an international crew or cast. It is actually a process whereby local people will also benefit from the whole process. They benefit in the sense that when a job comes here, they get jobs. Now let's look at the company that's handling the Mandalorian here. Yes, it is uh, it's a company called BaseFX, right? They are based in Bangsa South, actually. Uh, if I look at their records, in the very beginning, uh, when they started out, um, they had a 55% international staff in Kuala Lumpur, 55%, and the balance was local. But by the time they were getting involved in stuff like the Mandalorian now, the 90% of the people involved are already local. So again, I mean, this is where that, that, that money was all about. Now, you could have spent the same amount of money as per the rebate to do training, right? But you and I know that this industry, the training is best 
how shall we say, exemplified or is best taken in when you do, when you get your hands dirty. So in this case, investment in production is actually investment in training. And the beneficiaries are always Malaysians. So that's why, I mean, there's no sort of, uh, I mean, we're being transparent here. Yeah? There's no hard and fast rules about, oh, our people are, you know, Malaysians are starving for jobs uh, or without jobs and suddenly these sort of things come in. So it works economically just like when your economic situation is a bit uh, weak, you put in more money in, more investment in, so that the whole cycle can start all over again. Uh, you might not see the impact immediately, but this is what has happened. Uh, you find as a result of just a project like Mandalorian, how many Malaysians can now put this highly acclaimed and highly complex Disney content as on their CV. Mm -hmm. It means that it makes them very marketable and they can command a higher uh, rate for their work and so on and so forth. Uh, because you and I know that the film industry proper here in this country have always been at the receiving end of what we call, um, uh, you know, without talking about Mandalorian, if you're talking about just the ordinary films, you'll find that the average person, you know, the average salary, the wages of the, uh, you know, the gaffer, the best boy, the lighting man, these are all uh, what we call very low. So this industry has never seen the kind of specialization that was, uh, you know, that is now possible because of technology. So uh, what we are hoping is that with the post-production site getting to this level, then it will spread out to the other facets of the industry for the live action films, for instance, right? The guy who, the cameraman, um, the stuntman, all of whom for the last 30, 40 years in Malaysia have been at the, you know, at, 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 at the wrong end of the economic stick. So maybe this is the eye opener. And like I said, uh, this incentive for Mandalorian, it's post-production, but it is also available for full production. And it has happened already. I mean, you will probably remember a TV series called Indian Summer. Uh, that was shot in Penang, but Penang double up for Malaysia. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Penang double up for India. Oh. Uh, it was filmed entirely in Penang, mm -hmm. but the story and the location for mass consumption was as though it took place in India. And this is where the other beauty about Malaysia. Malaysia can become any country in the equatorial region around the world. So meaning, uh, you want to film a, a film about, um, uh, you know, taking place in Hanoi. You can simply go to somewhere near uh, Kuchai Lama here, and one area could look like Hanoi in, you know, 1960s or 1970s. So that's the other purpose of the incentive, mm. so that, you know, it's linked, so that productions could come here, shoot shoot in Puchai Lama, it doesn't matter if the script is about Laos or Vietnam, that's the, the final product. But during the shooting, the exterior is in, uh, you know, Sumai Seaport or in Parit Bunta, wherever. Hmm. So that's the attraction uh, factor. Yep. And uh, we must remember, there is an economic multiplier involved here because there was a study done uh, in 2015, I think, where for every ringgit that we spend, we get 3.27 ringgit back. And this is where we go back to the incentive. Nobody gets the incentive just like that. It is based on what we call the qualifying Malaysian expenditure. So your production could be, let's say, 20 million ringgit, uh, a foreign company. Let's say they have a budget of 20 million ringgit. But they are only going to spend 10 million in Malaysia. That is the basis for the 30% rebate. It is what you spend here. And what do you spend here in Malaysia? You would spend it, well, firstly, on your hotels, accommodation. You would be renting a car here. All these qualify to be in that uh, portion from which you could get your rebate. And whenever there's a big production that comes here, 
uh, you know, can you, you remember, right? They will probably book the whole hotel. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 20 flights. Huh? So that qualifies as a Malaysia spent. Now, they would be needing transportation. So whatever cars they rent, that will qualify. That's not counting whatever food and beverage they actually consume, right? Or maybe, you know, they would buy a whole stall of durian, musang king, just to enjoy. <laughs> so all these things would have a receipt and all these receipts would be audited at the end of the film to confirm that you have actually spent that amount of money in Malaysia. And when that money is spent, that's where the 30% comes in. So that's the normal feature. In Mandalorian, it's not so much the production, it's the post-production. So it depends on, again, how many Malaysians you, you have employed because their salaries would come into that qualifying expenditure. And guess what? These guys pay tax, right? So the money goes back to the government. Mm -hmm. Then they would go around near Bangsa and, you know, enjoy whatever, you know, thank God it's Friday, like tonight. <laughs> and the business gets the, you know, the owners and they pay tax. So you see, it has never been about, uh, I'm giving a free money. And besides, you and I know in the entrepreneur world, nothing is free anyway. That's right. Everything is always like there's an opportunity cost uh, involved in the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, basically, in a nutshell, that's what it's all about. It's about job creation here. Like, uh, for instance, uh, if you're talking about uh, the incentive as, as a whole, from 2013, uh, there's statistic here that we have, uh, they have created 6,000 local jobs. Wow. So you have given jobs to 6,000 people. Maybe it's all freelance, but it doesn't matter because freelancing is part and parcel of what we now call the gig economy. So uh, it's nothing new. Freelancers have always been around and you know that the new world today, the new economics today, actually say that an editor can do his edits at home mm -hmm. without even being, you know, moving about. Now COVID has actually uh, brought this up to a certain level of uh, even uh, a deeper understanding of what can happen the one who creates the music for a film can actually create the music at home, right? The yep. hair designer, the costume designer, all this, uh, what is basically a home-based situation, which was the case even before the COVID. Because the only part of this industry which involves uh, moving around is when you are shooting, right? You are acting uh, near the Penang uh, Bridge or you go to Putrajaya and, you know, you know, the Hindustani films, all this, the, the dancing all around lake, uh, the lake in Putrajaya. That is the exterior. But later, this raw footage would have to come back to somewhere. And this is where, if it's a foreign company, if they actually hire a local company to do the color grading, you know, the sound effects, that qualifies for the incentive. So it has been a very sort of well thought out scheme, uh, which um, fortunately, uh, with more and more people understanding it, it is becoming uh, one of our main economic drivers. Mm. So although it's meant for the creative industry, but remember, it has its spin-offs also in what we call the non-creative side. I mean, the car hire is just one small example, but you would also have the insurance guys the insurance guys will be hired for, you know, the contracts for the local guys in case of accident and so on. And what about their employment, especially now in COVID with the health offices? Uh, because right now, one of the conditions is that when you do a film or a shoot, uh, you need to have someone who is an expert in, uh, you know, the, uh, the pandemic and in health uh, control. So, uh, there you are. It's one big little circle. So to anyone there who says, why are you letting the Malaysians uh, unemployed and all that, you are actually uh, saying things from, well, the perspective is there, it's true. There is a lot of unemployment. But what is happening with here right now is to create the demand for these guys to know, to be able to supply their talent and their skills. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, it's very hard for... Uh, 
people to see that because uh, we, are, we are very, especially for, for those of us who are not in the film industry, you know, uh, all, all we know is what we see. And it can be either the low location or the actors. And that's, that's mostly it. But I think uh, a, lot, a lot of us are not aware about actually how uh, powerful our post-production and creative uh, industry is over here yes, in Malaysia. Yes, because it's going to be the same thing like, uh, let's take tourism as an example, right? I mean, we spend a lot of money to attract people here. And uh, normally they would do it on billboards in New York, in London, or in uh, New Delhi, Tokyo, you know. It's all about spend some money so that people could come here. But today you and I know, and the Koreans have proved this, all you have to do is have some good drama, some good music, K-pop, you know, whatever band, band boys or band girls that you have from Korea, and that's it. You will now plan your next holiday, uh, you know, in Korea. So this is why we should never, never underestimate the creative industry in terms of its economic power, because it has a relation to also, uh, let's say, to the investment world. I mean, I know you and I, we have been involved very much in the entrepreneurial side of things, investors, stocks, uh, you know, seed capital, funding and all that. But here, you also have another component which has sadly been seen only as an entertainment sector, seemingly without any connection to the economic, uh, you know, the economic sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if you take the common denominators like job creation, yes, see what happens because of COVID, people are making films, they employ, so jobs creation. And then when you do a uh, work for, let's say, an OTT channel, you also have the people who do the subtitling for the heart of hearing. So you create another kind of job. At the same time, you look at the advertising element. If a food um, product sponsor one of these things, <laughs> they could have the guy sort of drinking whatever, Coke or Pepsi or whatever, and there you are where the normal cannot be sort of exercised in the usual way, especially in the COVID, you know, in a pandemic time like this, you find the same mechanism is also applied to people who stay home, watch Netflix, uh, watch a Korean movie or watch Korean drama where they are eating toboki or mm -hmm. uh, what, bibimbap or whatever they call it. Yep. Next thing you know is home delivery. Right? So the food industry, which seemingly is unconnected to the creative industry, now gets the boost. Yep. And don't forget, what about the guys who deliver these things to your house? So which means that Grab, Food Panda will have their own momentum as well. Yep. So it, it, it is all about uh, kicking in one to the other. Yep. And where investors come in, this is where investors will now say, okay, since everybody is staying home right now, we can be putting money into apps that, uh, you know, apps that could um, facilitate and make our ordering more convenient uh, to know about news and so on and so forth. And this is what R&D is all about. So you will find another stream of revenue coming in into R&D just because you have a situation right now where, guess what? The very same people who are involved in maybe Mandalorian the computer graphics, the 3D artists, will now be doing things for, you know, for an app, um, you know, for yep. food delivery or transport or e-magazine or e-book or the whole lot. So it's never been a wasting, you know, it's never been a wasted effort hmm. because the government spends a lot of money in training, okay, every year. How many uh, Malaysians graduate from multimedia university USM, UUM, in all what we call the creative industry area, right? So it could be even something as uh, basic as uh, journalism or media broadcasting. Now, where would that skill be deployed? So the demand has always to be created in terms of the audio visual industry. So maybe all this film, TV, even games for that matter, and you know, 
games is actually has a very higher, you know, a very high, it has even a very, uh, the revenues from games is even bigger than the uh, films themselves. So all these actually have a common trend. They are using the same skills. They are using the same, uh, what we call the entertainment economy. Uh, maybe that's the word. I've read a book with that title. It's all about making something bigger than what it is. And bigger than life has always been the mainstay of the film industry. That's why you have the big screens. Now, home viewing. But the screens are also getting bigger. I mean, mm. since when uh, is a television act like a television today? Yeah. Once upon a time, we call it a monitor. And today they call it what? Tele-virtual? Mm -hmm. Because you could hook it up with the broadband, internet, whatever, and you get everything. So all this is actually have an impact on the way business models are also changing. Yep. Because advertising will now have to take note about all these changes and investors and all the big companies and all the, you know, the, the new, the new, how shall we say it? The new businesses that are emerging that will be leveraging on this digital environment. Yep. They have a bigger basis now. So mm -hmm. it's not just entertainment. So I think that that old thing about, oh, it's a film industry. Oh, it's about entertainment. Uh, no, yep. not long, no longer that. Yep. Because that very same audio visual environment is also important, let's say for an advertiser to talk about his product. Mm. Now, whether that product is a physical product or an insurance product or a financial product, it doesn't matter. Mm. You still need that entertainment economy to attract people. You have to stand above the crowd. That's right. yep. So what do you use? You use what is known as star power. Mm. The same way that Hollywood uses uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger you know, as a as a as 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 a crowd puller, Brad Pitt, or Roshni Khan in India, mm -hmm. you know, you use that same kind. So, for me personally, I mean, after all these years, I've never seen any difference between any other economic parameters and the creative industry, except mm -hmm. that it's hard to convince people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's 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 very easy to just uh, imagine that the film industry or the creative industry is just exists in a vacuum instead of an ecosystem of the entire economy, right? Correct. And that's, that's, that's why it's hard for people uh, to connect unless you look at the numbers or you're actually involved uh, in the entire process. That's and right. over here, you know, you, you mentioned about, oh, uh, now people are staying at home, screens are, are getting bigger. Uh, we've got uh, Henzi Andalas who, who's joined us uh, on this stream. He said, uh, the Mandalorian, they watch at home, that's why saw the ending credits. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, and then he also shared that hopefully we get more big productions coming here after the COVID pandemic is over. Mm -hmm. Yes, we hope so too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you mentioned about the, the success of Korea, right? Mm. And, and their creative uh, film uh, entertainment industry. And I think... That's, that's the thing that's very hard for people to understand is that you, you suddenly have this uh, sudden influx of Korean entertainment maybe half a decade or a decade uh, ago, right? But you don't really realize and understand this impact until years down the road. Right. So it's, it's hard for people to imagine uh, the impact of that uh, constant uh, uh, consistent investment in the industry and uh, what it brings. So what, what do you think that Malaysia can learn from the Korean strategy? What did Korea do right? Well, this is just a, a personal view. So some may not agree with it. Uh, but having sort of observed what the South Koreans have been doing since 99, 2000, uh, 20 years ago, uh, it was quite obvious that at the time when they were just beginning, they were actually taking advantage of what is known as the, um, the technology changes that were going on. Broadband was still new at that time and so on and so forth. But the Koreans did something which is quite, um, I think, commendable in my view. They suddenly realized that they have a culture 
which they would like to export to the world. And okay, this is partly because of their historical uh, rivalry, I suppose, with Japan, um, because Japan uh, occupied Korea at one time, right? So uh, at that time, if you remember, J-pop was sort of ruling the airwaves. And I think every other Malaysian was uh, fascinated with um, Japanese uh, manga, mm -hmm. anime, and the games, of course, they were all coming in, you know, Nintendo and everything all coming from Japan. Um, and even uh, television series at that time, okay, there was no streaming, but uh, there was a program called Ocean uh, on RTM, I think, uh, which is soap opera, so which everybody was watching. So Japan was ruling the, how shall we say it, was ruling the waves. Japan ruled the waves. Now, Korea in 2001, simply adopted the approach. This is the government. They approached the fact that the only way where the Korean manufacturing industry could go up into the world in a more confident way, if we have what I described earlier, but which I didn't know then, as the entertainment economy being brought into the picture. So they brought the facets of the entertainment economy in order to beef up the products of their manufacturing industry. And guess what? It's films, TV, music, and to some extent, uh, not so much comics and games, but really it was film, uh, music, and uh, what we call the traditional uh, ex expressions, right? The cultural expressions. So, they had an agency called the Korean Culture Content Export Agency, or it was known as COCA in those days, K-O-C-C-A, Korean Culture Content Export Agency. And what is the purpose of this agency? If you make a film, make sure the film is universal enough to be exported, but make sure inside there you would have scenes of Korean food so everybody must know kimchi. Everybody must know bimipap, whatever. Then they put in the culture element. Everyone must know that there's a big difference between Korean kimono and the Japanese kimono. And when a Korean woman dress up for a, uh, you know, for a uh, function, their fashion and their style is Korean. It's no longer Japan. But at the same time, they also inculcated what is known as K-pop. The origins of K-pop was in a strategic effort by the government to create one male singer and one female singer in five years that would always look like the Japanese, but actually would be highlighting Korean songs and the Korean values. So that was why Rain, there was a very famous singer at that time called Rain, and the lady, I think, was Boa. Hmm. All that emerged around 2005 and 2006 as a result of this COCA policy. Now, film. The government would subsidize the making of films there, but they do not do that by themselves. They would be telling LG, Samsung, and Hyundai, hey, you want your new car to be sold well? Put it in the film. That's almost like us saying Proton now becoming one of the firm supporters of our films. And I think they are actually to say, right, my new prototype, which is not even out in the market yet, but it will appear in this film. Every handphone, new design. If you notice, 2001, one, two, and three, they were all in Korean film. And you tell me which Korean film doesn't have a scene where they were eating something. The whole purpose is to export this thing called Korean cuisine. Now, why all this? It's just to give confidence because if you like K-pop, if you like K-drama, would you have any uh, reservations about buying uh, LG or Samsung TV? No. It's all part and parcel of that whole economic uh, threat that we were alluding to earlier. 
Mm-hmm. It's all about giving confidence to people. Just like at one time, I mean, we all go for Japanese goods because it is associated with uh, all things good. Mm-hmm. It's coming up from Japan. Uh, not only their values, but their manufactured goods, the, how shall we say it, the quality of their industrial products. So that was what happened. 2001, 2002, they had a Korean culture content export policy. Mm-hmm. That main agency was actually guiding the music industry, the film industry, the television industry, and even theater, and even the fashion industry, what needs to be connected with everything. Mm. And that's how they were giving their funds, unlike Malaysia. Mm. Malaysia, each of this industry is still seen as a separate vertical today. And that's what we can learn from the Koreans. In 2002-03, they have already turned all this film, TV, fashion, architecture, whatever, design, right? As basically horizontals. Mm. And what uh, I became the verticals is the funding support, the manpower development, the infrastructure, so you see they are reverse. In Malaysia, it's the other way around. What you will find is that one vertical called film and TV, that's where the funding support is just for that, right? The infrastructure will just be for that. The manpower development will just be for that. Without realizing the example for our Malaysian cinema here, the manpower for the film industry could come from the theater industry. Uh, you and I know that some of the best actors in the world actually began life at the theater stage, right? Mm. But here, the two things are separated. Okay, they're beginning to see it now, but policies still need to be tightened up. Just like I was telling earlier, you train somebody to become a 3D animation artist. Yes, you can use him for, you know, Bobo Boy or Upin and Ipin, but you can also use him for, uh, you know, for, for massing developer in order to design their new housing project, right? But it could also be um, useful for education. When you're teaching kids nowadays on a very audio-visual, short-snacking kind of attitude, you need some very impactful animation or a hybrid between life and animation in order to get your message across. And even the government if the government wants to show statistics or whatever, you need to use elements of audio and elements of visual and animation all comes in. So that is why the training of 3D animators shouldn't be seen as just for the film, TV and animation industry. It cuts across, right? So it cuts across. So because of that, that, uh, well, actually that's my theory about the horizontal and the vertical, mm-hmm. but it's just my way of sort of summarizing yeah what Korea was doing and what we are not doing. So in the case of Malaysia, it will take a challenge, it will take some time because we are still saying these industries, we are actually related, connected to one another as verticals. Mm-hmm. Each with its own, huh? right? Remember, I was telling you that vertical and funding support. You see, even like in the budget today, if anything is announced for the film industry, you know, it goes there. Mm-hmm. If it goes for the digital economy, it goes to... Uh, you know, to a particular section. Mm -hmm. Whereas, that should be like one block. Mm -hmm. 500 million is going into skills development for the creative industries as a whole. That will cover film, TV, fashion, (laughs) uh, you know, theater, music, everything. Mm -hmm. Because they are connected, thank you. They are connected. And anyone who wants to challenge me to say that they're not connected, I am more than welcome to bore you to death with my theory and my... Yeah, especially coming with your finance background as well. You bring the numbers Uh, onto the table. uh, uh, Maybe that's why they couldn't stand me in finance last time because I was trying to run the place like a a finance controller was running the place, you know. Well, because at at the end of the day, if you accept this, uh, okay, if you accept this as a revenue generator, of course you have to see everything in terms of ROI, right? But 
we accept that there's also such a thing as return on social investment. Mm. Now, you mentioned earlier about how it takes time before things are... So, there is such a thing called a seeding period as well. Now, that's not just for the creative industry. Seed capital, uh, you know, venture capital were required also for IT startups. I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it's the norm. It's not an exception anymore. Mm -hmm. So this is why uh, when you start to see things from different sort of angles and you try to justify why, and also there is another factor here, when different elements of this are in different ministries in Malaysia, that's where they have problems too, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because one would have been taking care of, let's say, one aspect of the creative industry. I'm talking about creative industry as a whole. Mm. So there are about four or five ministries all taking care of uh, portions of that industry. So that's why that embedding, that seeding, and that integration, like Korea, will be very difficult to achieve. Mm. Unless if something really radical, you know, yep. is done. And it's not impossible because we already know where the common denominators are. Mm. We know where they are, and they're all, believe it or not, economic denominators. Mm. You can't separate the two. Uh, you know, ROI in one, um, investment in the other. Uh, you create audio visual, you create games. It's for what kind of market? Mm -hmm. uh, and the only way where we can know the market, and remember, it's not just Malaysia, you have to be ready for the world as well. So that's what I meant earlier, where everything should be just put on one. Maybe it's um, in England, they got a minister of digital. Uh, I think, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. No problem. Yep. So, um, yeah, in, the, in, a, in a nutshell, I mean, it all comes back to ROI. Hmm. Uh, we must make sure the investors get back their yep. They are what you know their money mm -hmm. and uh, even for films I mean everybody is asking us about why are Malaysian films uh, still not sort of up to the mark and investors are always very fearful about investing in Malaysian films mm. why because the market is still very much focused on domestic mm -hmm. what we need right now is a change of you know perspective and that is why co-production to me is very important right now. Because mm -hmm. when you do a co-production, you have two countries, three countries involved in the making of a film or a TV series or a game. Immediately, you already have three markets automatically. Mm -hmm. Automatically, you would have three markets. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. With those three markets, you, many investors can see some you know, some sort of quantifiable amount about their return on, on in investments hmm. rather than uh, uh, right now. Uh, how many films are made in Malaysia right now costing more than 2 million and getting only about 200,000 at the box office? Hmm. So after all that, I mean, would anybody, you know, want to think about investing in films? Yeah. Uh, but you see where some of the, where some of the little uh, spanners have been thrown in of late. There was a film that was released directly to Astro first, and it made, what, four million within uh, five days or something. Wow. Why did that happen? Because it was not meant for the cinema, it was meant for the online environment, which is, the timing is good, because everybody now wants to watch movies in the house. <laughs> so whoever he was, he knew what the market was. Yep. So again, you see, it's a business decision. Mm -hmm. I'm not making it for the big screen because the cinemas are not showing any films at this moment, but I do have a smaller screen. Mm. So everything was budgeted accordingly and so on and so forth. So you see, behind every kind of this kind of success, it's not just the creative success. There's also a business man involved. You know, just like to say behind every successful man, there's always a successful woman. Mm -hmm. Well, they have to be referring to the why, although I don't think it, you know, it's true all the time, but, <laughs> but at least in business, in any creative business or in anything else that has nothing to do with financials directly, mm. the fashion business, the food business, 
apart from the cook or the, 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 the genius who came up with the recipe or with the design, there's always a businessman behind. Yeah, yeah. Because they are the ones who are then, you know, position that mm -hmm. new product or that new service onto the market. Yeah, yeah. Same thing with the film industry as well. Yeah. So Malaysia, film industry, domestic. Mm. I still don't understand it. Even if it is uh, not successful locally, if they had made something that is also meant for overseas, and this is supported by a good marketing situation, it would still be okay. Yeah. But uh, everything is a bit detached, right? It's mm -hmm. a bit detached. I mean, you have a product, and sometimes you don't market it well. And sometimes the solution to marketing is about just bringing the final product over and try to sell, sell, sell. Whereas you and I know that when it comes to product or service, especially from the IT side, even while it is work in progress, you're already selling it. Right? You get your sales agents or your distributor right in front. And sometimes they can even tell you about the market forces that will make you change your product. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because demand, I mean, changes all the time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, so the whole economic uh, spectrum applies to almost everything. Yeah. And although we're talking about film tonight, but yes. Yeah, I think you, you touch on a very important point over there on uh, the power of pre-sales, pre-selling, right? That's what we see what Tesla is, is doing uh, with, with their cars, their trucks or, or whatsoever. And like what you shared, it also gives the opportunity for direct feedback from the market. And as you're creating and designing your product, you're able to shift and uh, adapt uh, to the market accordingly to deliver the perfect product uh, at the end of the day. And right. yeah, and I think like, uh, like what you shared, it's, it's yeah, it, it seems that the common problem is that uh, there seems to be a, a segmentation between the different ministries. Uh, it's not integrated. And then also in terms of the entrepreneurs uh, in the local film industry, uh, I think in a way it's, it's thinking too small uh, mm. rather than thinking global, thinking, oh, how is it that we can partner with our other partners to extend uh, our reach? That's right. You're absolutely correct. And yep. this is why if you look at the success stories. Well, okay, I have to bring this up again, Upin and Yipin. Why is it successful? because it has a good businessman as its leader. And he's not even an artist. And I always make fun by saying that he can't even draw anything well. <laughs> he's listening, he'll probably say uh, again. But all I'm saying is that you have that perfect combination between people who are creative and a businessman who is top-notch. Then things move. Yeah, yeah. Because you yeah. need that drive yeah. to, to push things across, right? Because how many uh, well-known products in the world? Uh, you know, somebody have patented something great, but it never got off the ground because uh, there was no business engine or the mm. business uh, drive yeah. that, uh, that, 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 that pushed it across. So it's the same thing. In you. Yeah. I, I, yeah, and I, I think it, it's also in a way where I, I would see it as a lack of confidence you know, in, in our own capabilities and being able to deliver great products, great services, great films uh, mm -hmm. into the world. You know, mm -hmm. I, I feel, feel that that's, that's the challenge that, uh, of the Malaysian mentality, mm -hmm. mentality at, at the moment. And so, uh, it's breaking uh, through. I mean, you look at the case of the Mandalorian, right? Mandalorian is a Disney uh, uh, product. Yeah, it's a Disney content. Everybody who works on Mandalorian now will know that the 3D example, the 3D graphic artists or the motion graphics people were Malaysians. Guess what will happen next? It's not just Mandalorian. This kind of information will pass by very quickly amongst the, the community, so to speak, right? So could the next uh, Transformers five minutes be made in Malaysia? Remember, this new film, right? I mean, just now we were talking about the traditional filmmaking, but this new filmmaking, anyone who stays at the end of the movie until right at the end, whether it's Avengers Endgame or Gravity or whatever, you look at the credits. 
they have outsourced their work to almost everywhere in the world. Mm. You'll find Korean names and suddenly, you know, it's double negative. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you find Singaporean names because double negative is in Singapore. Yep. Just like at one time for Life of Pi, we've got Rhythm and Hughes here. So Malaysians were credited at the end of Life and Pi, of the Life of Pi, because the tiger in that movie was actually conceived in Cyberjaya. Oh, wow. Yep. Yeah, there was what, what, what happened. There was a company here called Rhythm and Hughes hmm. in Cyberjaya whose job was to take five minutes, ten minutes or whatever Hollywood is doing because Hollywood is always looking yep. for cost reduction. Hmm. Uh, this is where the business part again. Producers are always looking for lower cost. Yeah. Uh, but when we talk about low cost, it's not like uh, sort of, uh, you know, very low that you can be exploited. This is about high-end talent. Yeah. Yeah. So for the tiger, I'm sure they must have looked at options, uh, whether it should be done in India or it should be done in Taiwan. Yeah. Finally, they settle in Malaysia. Yeah. So what does that mean for us? It means our marketing right now will be through films like The Mandalorian. Hmm. Right? Yeah. So somebody sees it, oh, Fina is made in Malaysia. You find all the names there. There's a company there. So they said, hmm. I'll talk to you, how much does it cost? Then they will say, hmm. You know, I have spoken to Americans where I said, uh, here is about 500 an hour. And they said, US dollars? And I said, ring it. Suddenly their budgeting process is like one third yep. of uh, what it is. Can yep. you imagine to a businessman, remember? Businessmen mm. are the ones who are doing all these deals. Yeah. The creatives, uh, it's not a group altogether. The yeah. creatives only come into action when they've got the funds and all that. Yeah. But really at the front end, it's always the businessman. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is why, again, I mean, we could reiterate, I mean, when we see that crazy rich Asians or whatever that's funded here, all that will happen is that somebody will tell Hollywood, hey, that Kakosa is a good place for the next uh, Bloomhouse horror film. <laughs> 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 Although... Uh, you know, they annoyed us, Malaysians, by actually putting Kakosa in Singapore. Mm, yep, yep. <laughs> but that's one of the magic of visual effects, right? You can put, I mean, as far back as uh, 99, 2000, we've got the Twin Tower in Malacca. There was a <laughs> film called Entrapment by Sean Connery was there. I mean, the late Sean Connery. Mm -hmm. So he was there acting. Uh, because um, there was a lot of interest in the Twin Tower at that time. It was the big tallest yep. building in the world, right? But unfortunately, they took the shot of the Twin Tower and they put it in Malacca hmm. in near the river and all that. So yep. a lot of people here were jumping up and down. <laughs> then I remember having to say, this is an industry where they could even bomb the House of Congress in the US. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is an industry of the imagination. Yeah, yep. So... Uh, please don't take it too seriously. That's right. Uh, because at that time when they were talking about this, there was an American film called Mass Attack, mm. where Martians remember invaded yep. the thing, and one of the first thing they did was they went to the House of Congress. Yeah. Shot every Democrat, Republican. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but you see, in the country where humor can be taken as is, mm. that's fine. Yep. Right. And this is where we come back to Malaysia still has a lot of uh, what we call restrictions mm -hmm. on what you can show. Like uh, we have the Twin Tower, but uh, we are very too cautious about how it should be used as a, as a location, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's the same thing for Putrajaya as well. I don't blame them yep. uh, because it's based on the attitude that uh, people really don't respect public public uh, areas, right? Mm -hmm. But of course, there could be policies where, you know, like uh, some fines or deposits or whatever. Plenty of ways. This is a small thing. Or yeah. what you would call sub sub sway problems. Yeah. Yeah. That can be resolved. Mm -hmm. yeah? But see what happens. Everybody knows the big man in London because how many films now feature the big man? Yep. So that's why, in a way, one of the attracting power is also to allow some of our you know, iconic places yep. become readily available. Now, whether later they film Putrajaya, uh, the, the, the bridge there, and later they transpose it as though it's in uh, Cambodia or somewhere. Don't worry about it. We are dealing with an industry of the imagination. Yep. 
uh, and this is where when it's linked to the education system, mm -hmm. I also believe that uh, we should all allow everybody to imagine at an early age as possible. Yep, yep. Yeah, def that, definitely. Yeah, yeah I, I think uh, especially with, uh, uh, do, do, especially during my time uh, when we were growing up, it's, it's always split into streams in our education system. You know, you're, you're either in the science stream or you're in the, the art stream. Mm -hmm. I feel that there should be a more holistic and integrative uh, approach. And that probably uh, accept, uh, makes, makes the whole situation of uh, uh, comfort compartmentalizing uh, a lot uh, a bigger problem here in Malaysia because we, we haven't really connected our uh, right brain and our left brain uh, mm -hmm. together in a That's way. Right. Yeah. Right. And to go to the creative economy, I know creative economy is a favorite word right now. That is one of the areas you've just mentioned that should be addressed mm -hmm. because if the, well, I mean, I'm using imagination in a very broad sense. But if someone at four years old, five years old, kindergarten, preschool, starts to get the imagination right, it's not that they will all become filmmakers or animation or singers. Or they, they will become later apps developer, games developer, IT, the whole works. So you see, the benefit is there. Uh, you know, you become an accountant, you are a an architect, you can be imagination lies at the you know the foundation of the creative economy. And here in Malaysia today, we hear creative economy. That's the flavor of the month. Everybody is saying creative economy, digital economy, creative economy. So I always like to put it back into what I call into the layman sort of perspective, right? Creative economy actually has been around for centuries. Because without creativity, no one would have invented the railway. No one would have invented the rocket you know, that went to the moon and all that. The only thing that's worth adding on to that is that this is where you look, it comes from places. And even like in China, I was told that uh, despite uh, the very rigid rules there sometimes, but education wise, people are allowed to imagine. Well, there may be constraints about what you can say, but imagination has never been an issue. Mm -hmm. That's why these countries produce the best engineers that could handle the biggest telescope in the world, the biggest dam in the world. You know, it's like uh, everybody thinks of it as a very scientific, very mechanical, very engineering life. But actually, it's the creativity part that was instilled in them uh, from early times. And for US and Europe, that is only a given. Hmm. When you are told at three years old, uh, what do you think of, um, let's say, Star Wars? You are actually potentially creating people who are able to express themselves mm -hmm. and who are able to make up their own minds about certain things. Mm -hmm. That is something that is missing here currently. Yep. Where you're not allowed. And that's why we are always so very averse to criticism. Hmm. Criticism in most other places where these things have been refined is like your feedback for your own next move. If I'm the one, you know, if, even if I have something like an insurance product, that criticism will only refine my product to make sure it's better the next time, right? Mm -hmm. That's even an insurance product, let alone film or whatever. But here, if I have observed, criticism is like... You know, it's like uh, people try their best to avoid yeah. criticism. Mm -hmm. and that comes with, like I say, because creativity is not being told uh, from their earliest age. Because what creativity, my opinion, my humble opinion, tells you even at that early age is that it is okay to agree to disagree. You like the color blue, I like the color yellow. Why should I quarrel with you, until, <laughs> you know, until, until the cows come home? Yep, yep. You like that color, I like this color. So what? Yep. But then you begin to enjoy diversity. Mm -hmm. Then I come back to Malaysia as a nation, why I believe the cinema should be make full use of this diversity. Mm -hmm. Because that's what it is. 
you know, like uh, I remember, I still remember a long time ago when somebody would tell me that, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, Muslims uh, do not uh, have their dinners with chopsticks. Then I had to tell them how, there are how many million Muslims in China. <laughs> yep. It has nothing to do with chopsticks or what, it's the culture. Yep. Yeah, just like a Catholic in the Philippines is different from a Catholic in Italy. Mm -hmm. now, this is the advantage of that, what I call that creative process at the early age. From there, you know the difference. And that's why cinema is also important because it's your window to the world. I didn't know the French actually had coffee in what looks like a bowl. Mm -hmm. But when you said the American way of drinking coffee, suddenly the French breakfast is like a big bowl there, the coffee is there, and the, the what they call it, dunking. They will yep. take donuts and dump things inside. Yeah, culture. Yep. So if you are exposed to all this at an early age, you will grow up, I believe, to be a better person. Yep. Because one, you can agree to disagree. Then you realize, hey, there are many types of people in this world. <laughs> so you cannot actually fall them and everything. Even when you think it's the same, it's different. Mm -hmm. Muslims in Malaysia practice things differently from Muslims in Turkey. Right? So different. So then you begin to realize, ah, you know, there's no such thing as a cut and dried way. And then guess what? So if you're a systems analyst or if you're a computer programmer, you become, you know, your mind is open to endless possibilities. Yep. Even if later you become a stockbroker or, you know, uh, you know, a CFO. <laughs> well, I'm, that's my theory. Yeah. <laughs> You could uh, argue with it, but uh, I believe uh, that underlies the whole. Yeah. One. Digital yeah. is a non-issue. You mm -hmm. know why? Because digital broadband is as exciting as switching on the lights now and you get lampu. That's right. Electricity. Mm -hmm. You switch on the tap, you get water. That's what broadband is all about. Yeah. The digital is that digital thing that yeah. we so highly about yeah. just that we are now talking about files or what we call bits instead of atoms mm -hmm. right? and it's not original i read it from the book somewhere atoms and bits yeah once upon a time physical and now everything is in bits yep. in yep. so that's all there is nothing you switch on the lights does anybody wonder about where the electricity come from so likewise when we are on zoom here i mean I wouldn't even know the mechanics behind it, but it's there. Yeah. So there's no point making a big deal about this in the 21st century. What we should be doing now is with these opportunities, what could we be doing now to get newer business models because of the new delivery mechanism, because of the new production mechanism also, right? I mean, again, coming back to the cinema, to content and all that. Yeah. Yeah. This film industry also needs the fashion industry. So that's the other linkage. Yeah. And like Korea, we could really go for that uh, culture content thing. Yeah. Well, to give you confidence in your manufactured products. Yeah. So it's all back to economics. Yeah. And yeah, I think the, the thing that comes to mind is that uh, there tends to be a, uh, too much of a focus in over-specialization uh, in our culture, and that, and a lack of cross pollination, mm. you know, that's where the greatest opportunities of synergy uh, comes in. Where one plus one does not equals to two, but there's a certain mul multiplier effect to it, and the biggest potential for growth. Right. And uh, yeah, so I'm I'm looking at the comments right now, and then uh, again we have Hansi says, "Wow, Rain and Boa actually came up as a government initiative. That is so forward thinking. Yeah, that that was certainly uh, something new." Uh, to me, and then yeah, it's uh, he also mentions Mail Toti four million genius timing. <laughs> yeah, Mail Toti, yeah, that's uh, that's the one that I mentioned in four days. Yeah, managed to and, yeah. five million, I think. Yeah. And we have uh, Edison Chong who says greetings. Uh, how do we design an ecosystem that is conducive for the creative industry, in particular the film industry? Please share in terms of the commitment and involvement of the public and private sectors? Well, I, I've touched on it on the horizontal and the vertical. Maybe he could PM me or DM me direct. Uh, you could engage the thing further. But uh, just to summarize, yes, that's how it is. Right now, all those industries that uh, Edison, was it? Edison? Yep. Yeah. 
what he was referring to, they are now in Malaysia still existing as verticals. Mm. And also the disadvantage as verticals, they have all the components or what we call the building blocks for industry attached to each vertical mm. without any connect. I think you mentioned also Yingju earlier about the, the connection. Yep. We are just trying to make that connecting the dots, so to speak. Mm -hmm. so the solution is to see the, like I said, the sector all as horizontals. Mm -hmm. And what should be the verticals are the, what I call the building blocks. Because the building blocks cuts across. Mm, yep, whether it's yep. infrastructure, whether it's money, whether it's uh, grants, or you know, whether it's marketing, it's all there. Yep, yep. Yes, and uh, preferably, they should all come under the ambit of one mm. minister, ministry or agency. Mm. Uh, like in Korea, what they did was the agency uh, was under culture and information but its jurisdiction goes over the film industry, which was in, into another ministry. But mm -hmm. they act as what you call uh, the one who has the funds. Mm -hmm. So who has the money can decide. Mm -hmm. So like I can, well, I mean, if that happens in Malaysia, I can now say, okay, you're making a Malaysian film. I want you to make sure that uh, in every film, you try to show somebody eating, you know, like nasi lemak or cha kway teow, <laughs> or are they, you know, or something. Yep. Just to show that's what Malaysia is all about. And you better do it fast because otherwise Singapore would say it's theirs. Hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think I think that's that's the thing also where you know we always hear hear Malaysians say, What? Singapore is claiming what? what? Chicken <laughs> rice or whatever again? Oh no. Right. So we put our you know, we put our flagpole there, you know, yeah. we carve out our own territory. <laughs> that would be through films and uh, you know and TV series and all that. So, I mean, well, okay, that may be a bit on the fun side, yeah. but basically that's what Korea did. Mm. See, in Malaysia, you ask yourself: ten years ago, were there Korean restaurants here? Mm. Now it's almost everywhere, <laughs> right? Yep. K-pop. Yeah. Now, how about the the dressing, the fashion? Fashion. Mm -hmm. yep. Everybody wants to become Korean and all because of drama, TV and films. So if anyone comes to me to tell me uh, these are not important, wrong. Economically, they are important. The problem with us is that we've been making very substandard content that can't even go out of the country. That's why most of our greatness is still trapped within the country. Hmm. And we always complain, oh, another country would take our, uh, you know, bate la, you know, goreng pisang la, you know, come from there, you know, and our Hokkien Mi is, yeah. you know, from another country. Yeah, so, so, so let, let's take this opportunity to call out to the visionaries, especially here in Malaysia, to mm -hmm. step up. Yeah. You know, stop, stop complaining, right? If, if you hate what you're currently seeing in the market right now, Go yeah. out there and do something about it, you know, because you you have the re resources. It's, I, I like the saying, as they say, you know, it's not a matter of a lack of resources, mm. but a lack of resourcefulness. Yeah, that's right. Right, you know, mm -hmm. I I truly believe that we Malaysians bole, you know, and that we we can instill it within us and go out there and uh, create amazing things, right? Yeah. Me, yeah. you have you have just said it. Resourcefulness. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. I, I like how you pointed out that with uh, how Korea uh, maneuvered uh, essentially as an uh, entity, as, as an entire country uh, into the sphere of making an, a dent, a cultural dent in the world. Mm -hmm. How they did it in the way where they, they saw an opening made by Japan with uh, J-pop. Right, mm. and then they they thought, okay, there's a, an opening there already, and that there's a level of market acceptance. So let's duplicate that, yes. but layer it with the Korean culture on top that's of right. it. And I think that's that is very smart mm -hmm. because that that was a question uh, in my mind. Okay, you know, what is the strategy to bring Malaysian culture mm -hmm. into the world? That's right. And I I feel that also in the way where. Maybe one of the, pro the problems with Malaysia is that 
as Malaysians, we don't really have a solid definition of what Malaysians stand for, right? Mm. We, we, we can talk about food, uh, and then you know, we, we do talk about our multiculturalism, but in terms of the Malaysian identity, mm. who are we as Malaysians? Mm. What, what would you say uh, uh, is, is our current imprint into the world right now? Who, who are Malaysians to the world? Well, that's, um, that's a very good question and something which I have also been thinking about and for which I don't actually have some cut and dried answers. Uh, the only reference point I could do is uh, to say that uh, I am the product of the 1960s. So I saw a Malaysia that was changing. Okay, when I say 1960s, doesn't mean I was born in the 60s. I was born in, <laughs> in the 50s. I must confess, yes, I'm from the 1950s. Uh, I was born before independence, but I grew up during, you know, the time when Malaya was becoming Malaysia, when Singapore was still part of us and so on. And we saw the transition from analog to digital, right? Uh, I saw at that time it was records, music, man, cassettes and vinyl, and then how it moved over to Sony Walkman and Today, it's uh, the kids are listening to Spotify. So if I were to take all that into account, all I can say is that while we do have that common transition, uh, what has not really happened is, uh, I wouldn't say integration, because when in the 60s, when I was growing up, I thought we were already having the best of all worlds, uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, like from primary school days, you know, you already know this uh, Chinese thing like that, Indian thing like that, Malaysian thing like that, but we would have a common interest mm -hmm. that would bring us uh, together. Like in my case, at primary school in Kuantan, even the, uh, the, sick, the sick boy, right? the Bengali boy, and Indian, Chinese and all that, we are all fans of James Bond. Mm. So the unifying factor was James Bond, which is really a pop culture thing. Mm -hmm. But we weren't so concerned about uh, who we are, actually, to be honest with you. As long as you like James Bond, <laughs> we don't really care. So that gave me a hint that when there's some unifying factor, that is uh, almost like, uh, it's not something that's imposed. It is there naturally. Mm. Uh, it can help things move. That is why when I went to Finas, I was trying to say the new Malaysian cinema should be on this common thing. Hmm. Someone should be making a film about a school in the 1960s just to show to these people in the 70s and 80s. What was it that made things easier? Now, we can't be imposing because that becomes political or a bit, you know, sort of sensitive. But... Then Ola Bola came along, football. Yeah. Malaysians can say whatever they like about each other, but when there's a nice football team, you know, football match, you would support like crazy for your own team. So then sports become like a unifying factor. So I've always maintained that you shouldn't politicize sports and things like that, including the cinema as well. Because those are the unifying factors. And they are the least painful. You know why? Because it's a natural thing. You have a Malaysian football team, uh, uh, you know, playing football against Singapore. The Malaysians will go crazy. Suddenly you forget about your little, uh, you know, your little, I disagree, la, that agree, but everybody agrees. Mm. So that's why sports, we can take advantage. Films, we can take advantage of where we do, uh, you know, primary school in the 60s. What's wrong with it? You know, show what it was like in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. Like when you're a boy scout, like me, I was a boy scout. When we go camping, do we care whose spoon we took when we wanted to have the sardine? <laughs> you know, you open a can of sardine, right? There's only mm -hmm. one spoon. Yep. And you just take the thing, take the tissue and wake up. So all this is teaching you that, you know, certain things are not worth uh, losing sleep about. But that was me. And the only thing I can do now in this, at this age is, you know, when anybody say about what kind of film should be made, uh, maybe we should start to 
you know, talk about the films, about the people in the 60s uh, who had an impact on our lives or what Malaysia is today. Because culturally, actually, it's already there. The, just the food alone has already shown you where that integration is. Mm. Yep. What? Dim sum. Uh, I mean, dim sum is no longer a Chinese thing. I mean, it's a Malay, Indian, everybody. And don't talk to me about koi tiao and bihun and whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. Even eating chopsticks here is already a common thing. <laughs> you know? uh, just like I learned how to use chopsticks at an early age because I found with fork and spoon, they all wallop the food first. So I need to be as fast, you know. <laughs> so I had to learn. Anyway, uh, that's just a distraction. But yes, the thing is, if I use England as an example, in the 1970s of England, uh, there were a lot of people that came in from Asia. The Indians and all that, because I believe at that time in Africa, uh, they expelled a lot of Asians out. Uh, it was that time. I think you would Google, you would know the history behind it. Anyway, uh, today, England has become enriched by the second, third generation of the people who were there. Music, films, and all that. Okay? Just like uh, a film about Queen Elizabeth. The director is a third generation Indian. Hmm. Right? Indian national. In the US, we don't have to say much. M. Night Shyamalan is a fourth or third generation and Ang Lee, third generation, fourth generation Chinese have all that. So you see, it is all in the arts where the integration is first sort of absorbed. And that's why I'm very, very sort of possessive about how we treat our arts here because that is holds the key. Yep. That holds the key. When you have Dondang Sayang, you could also have the Dondang Sayang from the Baba and Nyonya. You see, things like that. Yep. Can you imagine a five-year-old watching it, six-year-old? Mm -hmm. Right. That would be the one that changed them. The old folks here, sometimes they are beyond, <laughs> beyond redemption, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, right? right? Mm -hmm. So, but we have a new generation now, which is fueled by digital technology, by streaming, by online, by more convenient ways of expression. Mm -hmm. So, we should be using, leveraging on all this to now say, okay, Let's make a film right now uh, about uh, the life in the 60s or 70s, some of the common things. Mm. Just like someone writes a script about a group of schoolboys who just like James Bond. Yeah. <laughs> Turn it into a comedy right? Right. Yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And then uh, you can say whatever you like, uh, but there was a time in the 70s where Almost everyone likes the Kung Fu films because Shaw Brothers at that time was having the one arm swordsman, the no arm swordsman, mm -hmm. the blind swordsman, the half blind swordsman. <laughs> Everybody was looking at the cinema. You see another common, common sort of thing that we did. But food, we don't have to worry about it. It's already there. Cha Koi Piao Lai, you go somewhere. And in fact, uh, it's, it's, it's common. Yep. Vade, banana leaf. So yep. all these wonderful things should be the subject of our culture export. Yeah, yep. Integration can happen. I know mm. you could also be referring to the bigger challenges in the other integration elements. Well, that is a bit too sort of, uh, you know, a bit too complex. Yep. Our sensitivities lie in many things. Mm. But I believe for the new generation, that is where we should be focusing on. Yep. Because they'll be growing up uh, just like, uh, you know, the people grow up with imagination. You can agree to disagree. And then you have a far better, uh, you know, Malaysian, uh, the next generation, right? Yeah. Um, I saw a film recently uh, about a short film about where the guy reversed the situation where the locals are the boss and the white guys are the servants and the driver. Now, that's what I call subversion, which is good. Because it's just another way of saying hmm, things could be different, you know? Yep. Just like we could be talking about the US right now, pop culture and all that. Yep. But we didn't realize that, uh, uh, you know, like the Chinese here uh, can look back at the culture thousands of years old from China, although you are Malaysians, but, you know, you could see yep. it it's like I'm a Malay, but I could look back at Malacca at the time. And the best part is that even as a Malay, I don't even know where my origins are, right? <laughs> uh, because from an early age, I was told that there was only uh, such a thing as Adam and Eve. Mm. So you see, it got me thinking, Adam, Eve, so if only the first two, so why are we bothered about 
the differences. Mm-hmm. Now, that was in primary school. Mm. So maybe that's, that's what made me what I am today. Yeah. You know, because I question that. Although mm. I assume the other things as being normal, mm-hmm. but uh, that helps. And today, I think the creative industry is the best uh, way to actually address all this. Yep. Yep. You, know, you could have music, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, words like tapau is already common here. So you can have a rap song with tapau with bole and everything. So it's there. It's mm. there. All we need to do is just to find a little, I don't know, key somewhere. Yep, yep. Yeah, and I feel that like what, what you shared, Malaysia has such rich culture and heritage to share to the world. And I yep. think even more importantly, especially in a world that is uh, so polarized, as I see us Malaysians as being very uh, understanding, of uh, each other's backgrounds and uh, not only that, we, we are very tolerant of the differences mm-hmm. but to take it be, beyond that, uh, what's even more powerful than tolerance is acceptance. That's right. The acceptance of our differences that makes us unique and how we embrace it uh, within our culture and have that sometimes tension but give and take that makes uh, mm. Malaysia beautiful. And I think this, this is a very, very valuable message to share uh, to the world from a Malaysian's uh, perspective. That's right. Yeah. And if I could add, if you are a film buff, that makes you the least racist of everything. You know why? You only look for good films. Mm. You see, my exposure, yeah, okay, I mean, sorry for bringing things up again, but uh, I can't relate it to you know, anything other than my own self at this moment. Right. When was I exposed? Okay, I was watching Malay films, Piramli and everything. And at that time, even the Chinese friends and the Indian friends were all watching Piramli as well, right? But James Bond could come along and suddenly that would be another common denominator. But we were exposed to, uh, you know, the Wang Yu, David Chiang films, the sword fighting films from that age. And then you grow up, you become French films, Italian films. So there's no room for racism. Hmm for a film buff like me. Hmm. So that's why I always make this comment and very few people actually <laughs> believe that I'm serious. Yep. But film buffs or theater buffs or arts buffs <laughs> are generally the least racist or the least people who would want to think about anything else mm-hmm. because beauty is seen for what it's worth. Yep. Good film, good film, bad yeah. film, bad film. I don't care if it is made by a green man or, you know, by someone who's, uh, you know, white skin or black skin or whatever. Yeah. And, 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 and it opens up. So that's why today, with audio visual being the main window by which our kids are now being exposed. Okay, no two ways about it. Our children today, even with online or whatever, they are being brought up on what is essentially a digital enable audio visual environment mm-hmm. right yep. so that's your answer if you know how to put in a strategy around it then all your tactical actions will have the desired effect you can even go as an end game now whether it's for business social engineering for you know relations whatever it applies. Yep, yep. Because that's how it is today. Mm-hmm. So if we do not take advantage of this, then we would lose out. Yep, yeah. I mean, it's definitely important for us to lean in to, to our strengths and understand the context, uh, the environment we are living in and really that's hone right. into the opportunity and realize uh, the vision that is already within us. Mm-hmm. You know? And then from realizing our visions, that's where new newer bigger visions you know comes into play and new possibilities uh, opens up that's right yeah and so going back to the comments i have a a year non over here who shares about uh says oh that your comment on kuman pictures and raw as finas's selection to represent malaysia at the oscars mm-hmm. yeah if you could share a bit of a background uh, on that well, and the answer. Uh, Raw is not the first film to be sent to the Oscar. Uh, there have been uh, submissions before. Now, I remember during my time, it was a film called Veda, 
uh, and then before that, there was a film called uh, The Lucky Harapan Dunia. That was in 2014. But I think even before that, there was uh, Putri Gunung Ledang. That was all sent. Uh, and last year, you know, or there was it the year before, Upin and Ipin, Chris Yamang was also nominated and the documentary M for Malaysia. So, Roh is not the first. But Roh is the first to be submitted under the new category in Oscar. Previously, it was called the best foreign language film. But for the purposes, uh, I think because uh, things are changing, so they changed the uh, category to, I think, best international feature. So he's right in the sense that it's our first submission to the best international feature category. But in terms of sending it to the Oscar, it has been sent before. Now, Ro. I saw Ro, uh, I think about, what, early this year or late last year. It was a sneak preview in uh, Banda Utama before COVID came. Yes, definitely art house. I left the cinema saying this is art house. It has all the attributes of something that could go everywhere at film festivals everywhere. So in a way, and I know Kuman Pictures uh, is an independent group. And I actually would like to congratulate them for actually achieving this feat. Because Malaysia has two support systems for film. One support system is for the mainstream cinema. Here we're talking about the big box office, uh, you know, everyone who goes into that category is about box office. Here we're talking about Police Evo, Munafik and all that, the big, the big budget, even Ola Bola is in that category. Then you have the independent. Now you and I know that the emerging talent is coming from the independent. So Kuman Pictures, uh, who I know have been around for some time as well. They have a philosophy about championing the independent film. And now with Ro, we are very happy that it has proven that a film of that stature could be created. Now, personally, I saw Ro and I had to see it twice to understand what it was all about. It's a bit like Tenet. Well, not as bad as Tenet. I think Ro is more easily <laughs> as about Tenet is even more terrible. I have to see it again. Uh, but Ro has what I call the attributes of a film that is intended to give you an ambience. Something that will give you Malaysia, yes, the country, but in a slightly different form. In the form of a folklore, you know, the way they play around with the uh, folklore. Because cinema is really about not just a story, it's folklore are uh, normally sometimes useful. So when people say it's ghost story, yes, part ghost story, part folk story. But really it is an art house film, which Variety is correct in saying, because not many average Malaysian would actually watch it and come out saying, I enjoyed it. It's a challenging film, but this is what I think Malaysian cinema should also be about, right? Should also be about. Not something that, uh, you know, like you are eating ice cream and then after that you throw away the stick. <laughs> it's something that, that, that sticks with you and raw remains with you. Mm. Even until right now, you mentioned raw. I have that image of the, you know, the scenes in the movie, the exorcism scene and mm. some of things like that. So in that sense, it's a worthwhile submission. Mm. I think they made the right choice. I think they made the right choice. Okay, great. Okay, so up next, we have Ronnie with a couple of uh, comments. I think he's playing a bit of a devil advocate. Uh, mm -hmm. He says, okay, politic. Now film is dead. In the 90s, Finas banned even ghost film. When all ideas are banned and film license applications are controlled, what do we expect in the past. Now the internet media has killed the film industry in local cinema collection. Vision needs money to survive and uh, that is fake ticket box office. <laughs> right, so yes. 
Yeah. Well, okay. In the in the nineties, uh, they had this thing about horror films and all that. But uh, you see, filmmakers are always creative. They got around it by putting at the beginning of the film that it is a work of fiction, mm-hmm. and uh, all the nice things to say to protect the film is in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Normally, you see it at the end, right? Mm-hmm. All persons or events is. Uh, actually implied and if any coin thing is all coincidental. But I remember at the turn point on the ghost films and all that, uh, they had to do in the very beginning that it's uh, fiction and uh, there was some mention about spiritual and religious elements in there as well. So in a way, uh, the ban was more like a knee-jerk reaction. I don't think anybody did any study. Just like at one time when I was into music, everybody said that if you listen to Black Sabbath or Metallica, then you are listening to the music of Satan. Mm. That happened too in the 80s, right? So it's all uh, a, a reaction. But reaction did not be counted with even bigger emotion. We just let rationality and the passing of time. Because generally, uh, things will somehow find its own equilibrium, right? Mm-hmm. So. When ghost films were technically banned, but at the same time, it was re-allowed, I mean, it was allowed again. You see the kind of um, excitement that comes into the, the, the situation. You've got Munafik and one and two, and then you even got a Hantu Mat Lima, uh, Kat Lima, that made millions, uh, you know, for, for Astro Show. So it's all back. You know why? Because ghost is part of our culture. You mm-hmm. cannot take it away. Yep. Every grandmother and mother will tell their children a horror story. You know, scary. <laughs> so it's part of our culture. And when streaming comes along, it makes a mockery of what you cannot show on screen, big screen, and what you can show on a big screen. So maybe it is evolving now. Maybe even the powers that be are now asking that question. Yeah, everybody is watching now COVID, what, eight months, nine months? Everything that we try to cut from the major cinemas, and now they are watching on a small screen. So what will Malaysians be like in, let's say, uh, early next year, when cinemas are open up again? Yeah. I believe that they are thinking about it, and they're trying to find uh, a balance uh, between the two. Yes, because on one hand, you have a laundry list, right? You cannot show this and this and this and this. But that's when you are shown to the public. Right now on Netflix, it's a subscription base. Mm -hmm. They have to understand that one important fundamental, the freedom of choice. You subscribe to Netflix because you want to watch Netflix. Right? That's right. So is that the same as buying a ticket to see in a cinema? So now you have two different rules here. So I think they were trying to find a compromise somewhere. But all I can say is that during the COVID, a new breed of Malaysian viewers are emerging. Mm. Malaysian viewers who are able to take it a bit more violent scenes, uh, more sort of very uh, sensitive, uh, you know, scenes and, and topics as well. I mean, come on, I was looking at the uh, haunting of Blythe Manor and uh, suddenly I have to explain to my children what LGBT was all about, mm, yeah. right? So it, 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 it is coming. Now, will it come in and change uh, perception? I think, yes, probably. But maybe not immediately, mm. but over time. Because now, audiences have an alternative. Yep. Yep. And cinemas have to survive too. So, I mean, I would still watch Star Wars, uh, yeah. you know, like... Uh, Tenet on the big screen. Yeah. So there will still be a market for both. So even if the cinema is closing now, I have a feeling like uh, once they're open, I think they'll be filled up again. Yep. But there are yep. certain things that are meant for the cinema experience and certain things meant for the... But censorship is a very sensitive item. Mm. Uh, we have a rating certificate, which is already an improvement from before. Many, many years ago in the 60s and 70s, every film that came here had to be made into a Walt Disney film. (laughs) Everything was cut. And I was very, very, very frustrated. That's why we smuggle in videotapes and all kind of stuff. Today, no need. 
Yep. Children, grandchildren, stream. Yep. Netflix has that, but there's a parental lock. Uh, so I do use the parental lock. Yep. Make sure the kids not see. So again, you see, the responsibility comes to the person themselves. Yep, yep. Taking Hi, the, guys. Hey, I'm sorry, Leon. I'm no problem. Yeah. Hi, talk. Dr. Kamil, how yeah. are you? Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, we were just talking about Munafik, and then previously we talked about Crazy Rich Asians. Uh, right. you know, uh, er everybody, uh, this is Leon Tan, uh, executive producer of Supernova, a Malaysia-based uh, audio post studio that specializes in sound design, Foley, ADR, dubbing, voice casting, ME, so on and so forth. Yeah, mm -hmm. glad glad to have you uh, join us uh, right, right now. Good. Good now. Okay. So I've, where are we? I've done my part. <laughs> I've done my part and I have to drink a lot of water now. So please. Yes, well, grab, I mean, grab, grab some, uh, some water. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, Leon, I mean, uh, with your personal experience, I mean, it could be on the, uh, you know, how these incentives uh, came in, uh, you know, to actually provide more jobs. And right. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, just uh, a quick background. Uh, yes, I... I I am a producer for audio posts and stuff like that, uh, but also I uh, am, am a producer of films, right? And, and things like that. So, uh, and Dato Kamil knows, has known uh, my struggle from uh, the mid 2000s, frankly. So uh, one of the elements that I think the rebate works is because people don't seem to understand that a rebate is designed to stimulate economic growth mm. as opposed to just subsidizing a production because the reality of, of, of what's happening out there in the world is that when productions, especially big productions, and mostly from the West or from China, mm -hmm. want to house their production in a specific country, it's more than just the fact that they have talent and infrastructure. They need to have, um, they're more, they're attuned to the fact that the government of those countries are willing to help bear the risk of making this production. And that's expressed in a rebate. So it's not, about subsidizing something or it's not about bankrolling something. It's about, I will give you this portion of money, of funds to help your production, to defray the cost of your production in return for you putting up the production in our country, utilizing our talents, our infrastructure and our resources, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, the number is small. So for the say 10 million spent in Malaysia, we'll only give, we'll give you 3 million, but the reality is that 7 million is spent in Malaysia. So what you have here is an economic engine. That's what you do. And that's the heart of rebates. And before anyone says, oh, but does it work? Well, I can tell you from my own observation that Canada, the UK, uh, various American states, Australia, all South Africa, all have benefited from uh, building a world-class media industry on the backs of rebates. Now, I'm not saying the rebate alone solved the problem, but it is an essential pillar of several pillars to boost the, the, the media industry, right? So I, 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 I do actually welcome the idea of a rebate, certainly. And, you know, everyone's saying, well, Mandalorian, you know, blah, 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 fantastic. It's as if the rebate is new. Guys, Dr. Camille knows this. It's not new. It's been around since 2013, mm -hmm. you know? It's just that right now people have understood that, hey, I can use this rebate as part of our story, you know, as opposed to just being a you know, a general uh, government policy, right? So that, that's, where I, that's where I stand in terms of the rebate, you know, certainly. Mm -hmm. yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, and, Dr. Kamil shared, shared with us uh, uh, yeah. a comprehensive background on uh, how right, the right. rebates has uh, applied uh, yeah. across the years and uh, uh, the mm -hmm. different kind of films that it supports. And he really opened uh, our eyes into yeah. Uh, the powerhouse of Malaysia's post-production industry, uh, including like uh, yourself, uh, Leon. Yep. I, I was. It's, it's, it's essentially, you know, post-production has been around and has attained in our country at least attained some level of uh, international uh, uh, recognition and standard uh, before production. Before uh, uh, production in Malaysia did, you know going back to the 90s where there was a made in Malaysia policy that allowed for pretty much every, um, every commercial, TV commercial that was made 
uh, had to be made in, uh, had, had to be broadcast in Malaysia, even if it's for worldwide or regional, had to be made in Malaysia in order to qualify for it to be broadcast in Malaysia. That essentially helped the post-production industry grow in terms of A, uh, upskilling themselves and B, attracting talent from overseas to make a home in Malaysia and build a, a post-production career and business right here in Malaysia, right? So we've had a long, long history from going back to the 90s. And we, 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 we then transited from short form, which is commercials, to long form, which is film. And that's why I'm always uh, happy to say, confidently, that if anything else, Malaysia right now, what you can offer to the world in terms of production is its post-production, certainly. Both visual posts and audio posts, and increasingly visual effects as you have seen in the, the, the you know, the, the, the fact that the Mandalorian all got, got finance rebates because visual effects was, was, was done here. Now, I just want to say that I, as far as I'm concerned, the fundamental aspect of why stuff like Mandalorian and so on was made in Malaysia was that first, the recognition that the talent existed, right? And then the rebates became the sweetener to close the, the gap. You know what I mean? So, so it's not about, hey, please use our people. You know, I will throw money at you, but our people are not very good. No, 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 no. Our people are world class, certainly from the post uh, perspective. And I look forward to the fact that together we'll make the other uh, jigsaw puzzle of our industry attain that level of world classness, hmm. essentially. Yeah. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about, uh, I, I think Dato Kamil must have covered it while I was away. You know, we all talk about rebates and government support and stuff like that, but essentially these things are just one pillar of several pillars needed to prop up the industry to, so it can attain and maximize its potential. You know? And one of them is that, uh, is, is, uh, I, I think I heard Dr. Kamil was talking about content, right? The idea of content. Now, it's more than just making content that looks good. It's got to tell stories that uh, would drive our, uh, you know, people to want to watch it because it's so competitive. What's the point of making a very expensive Malaysian film, but our storytelling standards are not as good as other uh, countries, you know? Essentially, people in, you, 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 your challenge is to tell a story from Malaysia that someone in Sweden will watch or someone in South Africa or in Canada would watch. And the first thing in their mind is, oh, this is a Malaysian film. The first thing in mind is, I love the story. You know, that's the heart of it, right? Now, in order to do that, and I, and I listen to all these you know, ministers talking about road to Oscars and stuff like that, you know, I, I, I was just talking to another industry friend a couple of days ago, and we, we came to the conclusion that if you want to go into that level of recognition that you are good storytellers and you're, you know, and you're good quality filmmakers, right, to, to reach that level of Oscar. And, 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 and Oscar, essentially, to me, doesn't mean just the Oscars, but the Cannes Film Festival, the Venice Film Festival, the Toronto, you know, all that kind of stuff, that kind of level of recognition. What happens here is that we, the government right now can do one thing that costs no money, no money at all, zero. It doesn't cost a cent. You don't have to throw money at this. And that is to remove censorship. Just remove it. Let people tell stories the way they want to tell. Cost you nothing, bro. Cost the government nothing. Just simply remove censorship. Because, you know, I've even seen uh, the public sector talk about how Korea uh, represents a, uh, you know, uh, it's like a role model for us to follow, right? In terms of winning the Oscar for Parasite. Have anyone actually watched Parasite? It is an indicting, scathing critique of Korean society. It's what it's about, right? Can you imagine if a Malaysian told a story about a, about a scathing critique of Malaysian society? That's not going to happen because of censorship. It's impossible. But it's that story that eventually went to the Oscars. So ask yourself this question. Are we asking the right questions? Mm. Are we well, doing the right things? We have, the, we have the aspiration, but do we know how to get about it? How about putting policy makers and, and, and leaders in all these positions of, uh, where they can enable this to be you know, fundamentally people who understand film, for one thing. People who understand the industry, as opposed to just being administrators. You know? Because increasingly, this is not a hobby. You know? this, is, this is a livelihood for thousands upon thousands of people in this country. And many of these people have proven that they can work in world-class environments by looking at, you know, Marco Polo and uh, Mandalorian and all that kind of stuff. So it's, Malaysians have proven it. Malaysians overseas have proven it. Adele Ng, Ng now writes scripts for Crazy Rich Asians and Raya. She's Malaysian, right? Um, 
uh, you know, uh, Henry Golding. Wow, you know, our, our boy is doing great in Hollywood, right? Uh, James Wan is a great director. So it's clear that Malaysians can do this. The thing that holds the rest of us Malaysians back must be a very, very open and critical examination of how we administer the growth of this industry, right? So setting a bar by saying road to Oscars, that's all fine and good, right? But let's talk about things you really need to do. And I believe, and I think many of my people, my, my, my colleagues believe in this industry, is to remove censorship, it costs you nothing. Let people tell stories, bare bones and all. Start the process of telling honest, clear, self-examining stories because ultimately these stories are the ones that touch the heart of people in my opinion not some big you know sorry to say big uh, epic uh, you know patriotic stories you know not that it's essentially everyday stories like for me for example one of the best malaysian films ever made if not the only one ever made is guang have you guys seen guang a story about a, a brother i mean a, a, a young man whose brother is autistic mm. right set in a hippo or KL, i can't remember now right yeah. That's a great story. It has nothing to do with how great Malaysia is. It's not even in Baza Malaysia, for, for, for one thing. But it is a truly beautiful Malaysian story. We need to start dismantling all these trappings that say, that try to define us, um, define what a Malaysian story is, uh, while at the same time trying to pander to some, 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 some political ideal, you know? Sorry, I'm, I'm going to say it all out loud, you know? And if you want to talk about a great, thriving, exciting, billion-dollar Malaysian film industry or screen industry, right? Start with removing censorship. Start with that. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, Dr. Kamio, I, I see that you, you're ready to, to share, ready to burst. Uh, we, uh, we touched on some parts of it earlier. Uh, right. Yes, uh, we did touch. So Leon is uh, what I call, uh, he is on the ground. Uh, he's got his hands dirty, unlike me. I mean, I'm just an armchair critic kind of thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, the points are all there. Although the only thing that I would like to add is that he says censorship is one of the important elements. Whereas I would like to say that Censorship actually is not the reason for not to have creativity because creativity knows how to circumvent censorship. Now, uh, Leon, I know we may have discussed this before, but it's a bit like saying uh, even the best films uh, that I consider the best films made in the world uh, today, uh, if I look at some of them, they were made at a time when censorship was still very strong in Europe but they still remain classics. They still remain masterpieces because the director or the writer or the production knows how to circumvent. So it's just like telling plenty of things without actually showing it. Now that's number one. But I will agree to some extent that censorship on what is the reality of Malaysia to some extent should also be removed. For example, if I want to make a story about uh, Rose Chow, what's the name of that stripper, yeah. uh, Rose Chow, yes, I would have no problems with a biopic about that because to me, it's not about bi uh, Rose Chan the stripper. It's about a changing Malaysia. It's because she was in that time when Malaysia was in transition, Malaysia was changing. So if a script comes along, uh, I would actually encourage that part where Rose Chan is well, it's a bit like Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump is there, but actually it's the history of the United States. I mean, I, I would go for that. Although Malaysia right now, I was telling uh, Ying Chu just now that because of the COVID, a lot of people are now being exposed to what's available on Netflix. So I think a new generation of viewers will also be coming up, will be asking the same question as you did. I mean, why now on a small screen I could see this, but on the big screen, Thing. And secondly, why can't I make films like that? So yes, Malaysian issues. Like uh, I've, I've always been asking, you know, if I make a film about Malaysia in the 1960s, when um, uh, Miss Malaysia was still being allowed, I mean, how would the census approach it? I mean, the setting is 1967, 68, right? Where there were still no rules and you could see advertisements where 
uh, you know, people were drinking Guinness Stout and <laughs> advertising and all that. So if you go into that era, uh, would you tend to block? I would say they shouldn't because when you reflect that era, that era is the correct era and whatever attributes that come with them. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and then I, I guess well, like, you know, well, with uh, what Leon shared about uh, censorship, yeah, it, it, it definitely... Uh, nudges the creatives to to work within the framework of safety because they're so afraid of the repercussions uh, from from uh, the authorities. So uh, I think it's also in a way because uh, as storytellers, as you know, people who go out there and create things, we must be allowed room to push the envelope, you know, to see see what what really works uh, in the market and. Uh, I, I do agree with Leon in the sense where, you know, there's a certain level of rawness in storytelling where you just have to break through the boundaries of censorship where, where people can really get it and feel it deep uh, within their hearts. Right. And uh, yep. Yep. that's, that's one, one of the things where I, when I, I watch Korean dramas, uh, it's only recently that I've watched Korean dramas. Uh, I started off with Sky Castle where I realized it's, they are willing to go, go really deep and really dark, you know, where where people don't uh, usually uh, venture into, and that's that's what really makes people uh, hooked. hooked yeah. Onto it. yeah, I just want to say, ultimately, what you're cultivating in a no censorship uh, situation is to instead of letting an artificial uh, setup, which is the government, tell you what can or cannot be done you are actually allowing society to decide that, you know? So I'll give you an example. You, let's go back to Parasite. Korea, of course, has no censorship whatsoever. They can decide to make a film like Parasite that is extremely visceral, gory, you know, sadistic, whatever, and say, hey, that's so Korean society. But no, they chose a wonderfully amazing metaphorical story of two families, mm -hmm. right? Now, you can say censorship may have forced them to do that, but what I liked was that uh, Bong Joon-ho and his team wanted to tell a story about Korean society expressed in that metaphor. And that means you've reached the level of um, uh, uh, mature storytelling that you can tell these kind of stories and, and 10 people can walk away from the film with completely 10 different ideas as opposed to one single idea. Another example I want to give you, uh, there is a, a, a clause in, uh, in our rules and regulations of, 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 uh, of, of film production, is that uh, a Muslim cannot pl play a role where he is a non-Muslim. Silly things like that, I'm so sorry, right? A few years ago, I, I was given the, the opportunity to attend the premiere of a film, Indonesian film. I think it was called Sucipto, if I'm not mistaken. It was a story of the Archbishop of Indonesia, who was one of the founding fathers of modern Indonesia with uh, Dr. Hatta and Sukarno, right? He was actually an uh, Archbishop, Catholic Archbishop in Indonesia, right? So the person who portrayed the role was actually Muslim, right? And he, you know, and, and he basically, when they asked him, how do you feel as a Muslim, you know, uh, uh, portraying a role of a Catholic archbishop? And he said, I'm not interested in the religion. I'm interested in the fact that he was one of the founding fathers of our country. So I played the role accordingly. Now, you see, that level of maturity really, really strikes me that this is not a, a, a oh, Southeast Asia, things are different, you know, you live in an authoritarian system. No, no, no. We all can do this. But what I'm trying to say essentially is that we don't need a government to tell us this. We don't. We should allow ourselves to explore. Yes, you're going to get a few, you know, exploitation films in the beginning because everyone gets excited for sure. But sooner or later, people will calm down. You know, you notice that when you see, when you, when Netflix, which has no censorship, right? There's a lot of nudity in it, but people get desensitized, right? You don't get excited anymore, right? Similarly, you get past that hurdle, right? When you make films. And sooner or later, everybody is just going to make films because the story needs to be told. Exactly like you said about Rose Chan and all that, you know, because right now our society is so inf infantilized because we have been uh, forced, I mean, co I mean we, we, have been, we, we have been guided by censorship, right? The reality is that exactly as you said, Dr. Kamil, someone should watch a, a, a Rose Chan film and say, instead of saying, oh, I want to see it because it's all about nudity, and more about, wow, this is Malaysian transition. What an amazing story. Just like people see Parasite. 
and say the same about Korean culture. We need to get there. And in my opinion, that's where you can finally say, yep, time for the Cannes Film Festival. You know, we need to get there first. So it is not about telling big patriotic stories or throwing money at, at films. It's about allowing people to tell stories the way they want it, they want it told yeah. and let the evolution take place. It yeah. takes a generation, but it'll be done. Mm-hmm. You know? You know. You know, it comes back to the education side again that I was referring to earlier. Oh, that's another pillar for sure. Yeah. So uh, we were talking earlier about, uh, let's say that if we focus on, how shall we say it, uh, elephants can fly type of imagination, even at the preschool level, right. then you will find that some of these guys might later become the chief uh, minister or the head of the censor board in one, you know, in the decades or two decades time. And that's where the changes will start to take place. So I am making that reference that this is what is missing at the school period right now where you can accept things like you can agree to disagree. That Mm. if you don't want to see a particular film, you don't have to criticize those who would like to see the film. So uh, maybe under our present circumstances, that's how uh, censorship or the elements of uh, restriction will slowly sort of fade away. And of course, COVID has uh, actually exposed Malaysians to a lot more than what they're used to. So can you imagine when this is all over, somebody might just say, hey, even that uh, two-piece bikini is no longer something to worry about. I mean, starters, right? And uh, the teams, especially. I know you mentioned about the teams. I am more actually interested, uh, if ever there's a loosening of flexibility and censorship, it's the stories that you are telling, the teams. Because right now, uh, the visuals aside, you know, when I was referring to the big, uh, the good European films of the past, when censorship was still strong in Europe, still, it wasn't so much about the visual. It's not about what you can see, but it's the stories that you are able to t- tell. Yep. And then the filmmaker just to convert things, you know, like, uh, what was it? Uh, Belle de Jour, right? Uh, by Louis Bunuel. Yeah, it's, it took place in the in the in the in the prostitute. I mean, is a in a bordello, but a bordello, you hardly yeah. see any nudity. You hardly see anything, but you know it is in the whole house. But the real story is about a you know a disgruntled housewife uh, who goes there for something else. And remember, so uh, I I always come back to that. So while censorship is still strong, I mean that's the kind of films that we could be making, <laughs> and then. Let us confuse the audience and, uh, you know, forever more. Yeah, and yeah. I like what you, you shared, uh, Nato, previously about, uh, yeah, with, with the framework of censorship, that's where also, in a way, creativity uh, mm-hmm. comes about in how you play exactly. around it, uh, share your storytelling through uh, metaphors. Mm-hmm. And I think touching on what you shared, Leon, about how uh, a lot of Malaysian storytellers feel that they need to insert that Malaysian element or what, what makes this film Malaysian and then they, they force it into the storytelling which makes it feel so artificial. And yes, it, it takes, takes time, I guess, for storytellers to mature uh, in that sense where I feel like if we look at Netflix, we look at Disney uh, for the past a uh, few years or so, we, we've seen a lot of uh, politically correct kind of uh, themes being inserted into the story where, where you, you, see, you see a rise of, oh, you know, yes, I, I, I insist on, on telling the story about women empowerment within uh, the context of Star Wars, uh, for, for example. And then yeah. it just, uh, it's just cringy. It, it comes across as artificial. That's the problem. Like, everybody wants, wants Rey to do well, the character of Rey in the last three Star Wars films. But because of the fact that she's so over-empowered in an artificial way, she no longer relates to anyone, you know? The audience can't relate to her. Not even the, the target audience, right? She's yeah. supposed to be young girls and all that, seeing her as a role model, you know? And that's as, as exactly right. See, the audience now is so... Is, is, I would like to think our audience is intelligent. I really do, right? And they can smell, they can smell PCness. They can smell self censorship. They can smell things like that, right? But if you talk about a case of, I come back to Parasite. Bong Joon Ho could have made a film that was straight balls to the wall intense, but chose to use a metaphor 
he had the choice to have made it as visceral as possible, but chose another way to express it. Now, here's where you understand that I want to get across this message as best I can without alienating my audience. And I can still do it in a world where I have no censorship. Man, when that happens, we are master storytellers. We're good at it. And we're not only telling stories for our people, we're telling stories to the world. And that's why you get an Oscar, my friend, because Parasite story was a global story, although it was completely Korean in every way, right? How do we get there, mm. right? How do we get there? And I personally believe relax censorship if you can't remove it. Be far more, uh, you know, put people in place in our, uh, uh, our uh, public sector system that watches over our industry, that understand film that are intuitive about cinema, hmm. right? And beyond cinema too, because as you and I know, someday cinemas may not exist thanks to COVID-19, right? Mm-hmm. But it will transit into other forms of screens, you know? Have people have, uh, you know, think about things like, oh, instead of going to the Oscars, how about setting up an education system where we empower uh, filmmakers? In fact, the word filmmaker sounds archaic. Uh, content, right? content creators, right? to tell screen stories, whether it's on a 40-foot screen or this very screen I'm watching now on, on, a, on a phone. How do I get there? How do I connect? Because that's the beauty, right? At the end of the story, and I, I know Dr. Kamil agrees with me, we started out drawing paintings in caves, right? 40,000 years ago. It's not, it's not how it, it gets expressed. It's not the, 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 the channel of expression. It's the way you express it. And we lack that, I think. Mm. We spend too much time looking at technology. Yep. Oh, yes, let's uh, spend money on infrastructure. Let's spend money on, 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 on you know, whatever, you know, software, you know. Mm-hmm. We, we, you know, like, 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 like for me, our animation industry has got, yes, we are way ahead in terms of CG and 3D, but we really suck at 2D animation because very few of our animators actually know how to draw. Can you believe that? Mm-hmm. And they are animators, right? Because they rely on software to... To, to, to create the models and everything for them to, to, to do the animation, right? But you look at all the great animation uh, countries that we, that we are inspired by, right? France. Let's, let's put in, uh, uh, America out for a while. Look at France. Look at Japan. Look at Korea. China even, you know? They all start by drawing, mm. right? We are missing these elements of, of, of arming our young generation to tell stories. Mm. You know, we're, we're missing that. We're relying too much on infrastructure and technology. Like, mm. oh, I got to get the best camera to tell a story. Well, to me, you are a DOP. If you can take a phone and, 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 and shoot footage that will move society, you know? After that, the camera you use is, is, is bonus. You know what I mean? Yep. That's how I feel anyway. And similarly for sc- screenwriting too. Script writing is essential, right? Um, I still know of Hollywood studios who refuse to w- look at proposals and decks, you know, visual proposals and decks, because they find it that it is too, uh, it wouldn't be representative of the story. They're just trying to sell the story to you. So they always ask for one thing. You know what? Please send me the script. Hmm. That's all they want. They, they don't want trappings. They don't want, you know, they don't want uh, uh, how, how visually exciting it is. No, 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 no. Send me the script. Because if they can be moved by words on a page, hmm. everything else is, 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 is forward. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That's 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 what I've seen. And I mean, it's it doesn't happen to every every studio, but I find that those who focus on these sort of things are, is where I go. Wow, this is where art meets culture, meets expression, meets the growth of a society. That's mm-hmm. what that's all it is. You know, ten years from now, we're not going to use the technology we use today. Do you know what I mean? But you don't want a two hundred, you know, a thousand kids to go. What do I do next? I don't have this technology anymore. Mm-hmm. No. You know, yeah. Just remove the internet for one day and you can see really what can happen. Yeah, yeah. I used to talk, I used to have this conversation with Dado Kamil years ago. You know, there's a difference between trying to create a thousand, say, a th- example, huh? this example. It's a difference to, when you're, to, to create a thousand, use government funds to create a thousand animators as opposed to 50 really good producers and storytellers. You know, because when I did an analysis on Los Angeles, right, the, the, the film industry in Los Angeles, it hires hundreds and thousands, if not millions of people. But the reality is that only about 15 to 20 people move the needle in that industry. Mm-hmm. Right. They move the needle. And I always the challenge is how do we create that 15 or 20 in our industry? 
mm. to the point that it becomes more like GNP and not GDP. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. A Malaysian film can be made in Scandinavia for all I know, right? But it was run by a Malaysian producer. So the concept of it, or a Malaysian writer. So the idea of it is that the value of having a Malaysian on board in your production mm-hmm. goes up because we, we pick the right focus on building the industry this way. You know, as opposed to building just factory workers. I hate to say this, but you know, the, the, the hands and feet. How about the brains trust? You know, the brains trust. And again, it comes back to what I think Dr. Dr. Kamil agrees on is that you start first in the public sector by arming the public sector with people who understand film. That's the start, mm. right? And then I will add on, remove censorship. <laughs> you know? And then everything else gets lined up. Yeah, you'll find that money is allocated differently. Infrastructure is decided in a different mm. way. You know, education gets completely revamped. Mm. It all follows from yeah. that. It all follows from that. Yeah. You know? that, that's how I feel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good points, yes. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think, yeah, what, what you share is, yeah, it's, it's really embracing the power of storytelling that already lies uh, within us. You know, mm. it can come, come from, uh, in the form of thought or imagination. And mm. I, I suppose, like what you say, those, those uh, minority of people who really moves the needle. I yeah. suppose it's a combination of uh, what we previously discussed with Dato Kamil, of uh, people who have that vision uh, with that story of what they want to realize in film or whatever creative pursuit, but at the same time, it's also to have that entrepreneurial mindset to be yes. able to communicate and uh, tell the story, sell the story to the investors and to bring all of the resources uh, together to realize it. Yeah. Uh, th- this could be a completely different Zoom <laughs> Zoom meeting just to talk about entrepreneurship in, in the industry. But I, I, I just do want to share one thought, you know. Many, I, I meet many directors, writers and producers who say, oh, it's so hard to sell my show, you know. It's so hard to convince people to send, uh, to, 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 to invest in it. And so they want the government to just give me free money to make my film, right? Now, in, in some ways, that, that aspect should exist in order to stir the, 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 the grassroots creativity of especially new filmmakers, right? But the reality is that to have a, 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 a set and, and entrenched group of filmmakers con- continuously uh, rather turn to the government to give them money to make their films as opposed to arming themselves with the right internal discipline to know what kind of film needs to be made and, and what kind of film can be marketed out there. Uh, I, if a distributor doesn't want your film, that's a natural no that the, the society may not want it. It's a natural sieve, you know, a natural filter, right? I always tell people that, hey, if, 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 if your, your script hasn't been, has been rejected a hundred times, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad script. It means it's either not this time, right? Or, or, or the universe is telling you, hey, not, you know, just, just don't do it now, right? As opposed to saying, I want to make it and then go to the government and, and ask for money. You know, it's, 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 it's a toxic mindset to me. You know, yeah, and, 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 and then, as you say, uh, Ching Yu, you know, that, that means that producers and directors start becoming entrepreneurial, right? What does it take for me to get that extra, extra length in order to make my story more uh, palatable and reachable to an audience? You're not pandering to the audience, you know, you are trying to connect with it, right? And so the, the stories that will, that will have a natural affiliation to how an audience will respond will be the ones that move up first. And you know what? That's, it's called the market. That's what it is. It's the market, you know? And, and, and what we need to arm ourselves as an industry is to have our own people, our filmmakers, our creative people be at least cognizant of the fact that they need to do this and then start their own journey of discovery, exploration and hard knocks in order to get there. Because you know what? That's where everything happened. You, we look at Hollywood and we say, wow, you know Hollywood, but they all started like that. All of them. Every single one of them. You know, you think Ridley Scott got it easy all this while? No. You think George Lucas got it easy all this while? Absolutely not. They started because they had to employ all these elements in order to get their projects across. Mm-hmm. You know, and we should do the same. Yep. You know, no more grand entrepreneurs, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the, the word that we copyrighted a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That we said tonight, right? We came up with grand entrepreneur. 
because uh, they're almost as bad as uh, serial killers because these are repeated uh, grunt entrepreneurs. <laughs> Yeah. That's the sad thing about grunt entrepreneurs is that they will make films that nobody wants to watch, but then they got their films made. You know, an industry never progresses, right? Uh, uh, no one gets upskilled, and guess what? A government will finally say this industry is not worth supporting anymore. Mm. Abisla, end of story. Uh, yeah, that, that's a sad thing, actually. I mean, um, this is the reason why even the government is not taking the industry seriously, right. simply because uh, the measurement has always been the box office, the box office. And that is why we have always been trying to encourage uh, the only way where, you know, to put your money where your mouth is kind of thing is if you make a film with the universal stories, then you can sell it to the rest of the world. I mean, it right. goes round. And sometimes even that, even without the uh, dollar sign attached to it, the fact that a Malaysian film has traveled to 55 countries or festival and all that, is sometimes... Yeah something which the public will see in a rather positive way. And yeah. uh, by the same time, uh, co-productions will also help, you know. So this is why during my time in finance, I was trying to encourage all this. But it was misunderstood because it was still seen as what you rightly said. Still, it was all about the, the box office thing. Something to do with the fact that to become successful abroad, you got to be successful locally. Yes, which I agree. But then when everybody thinks about just local, then nobody starts to think about whether, you know, that particular film or that particular story can travel the world. So yeah. that's why we've got very few and far between. Eh? And don't forget 2019, last year, uh, the three biggest box office uh, successes were all animated films. That was last year. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I mean, we, we, we talk about uh, uh, giving grants to the industry so and and also about the protectionist policies, uh, which you mentioned the on about the uh, made if uh, uh, if something is to be advertised in Malaysia, it has to be made in Malaysia, uh, for example. So, so where do we draw the line uh, in terms of nurturing an industry to the point where it's able to stand on its two feet, and then we say, okay, it's time to take off the, the training wheels. It's time to stop these protectionist policies. Or uh, will there always be a certain space where uh, grants or protectionist policies will always uh, have its place? Uh, okay, speaking as, from a producer's point of view, I can give you specific examples of how it may be able to push our industry forward, even with grants. Now, I'll give you an example. Um, if, in my opinion, if I was someone who's issuing a grant, the first thing I'm going to check when a project comes on board and a team comes on board asking for a grant, the questions I'll ask is, this grant, what is the component of this grant against the production budget, right? If it is 100%, okay, you're lazy. You didn't even bother to, 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 to check the market. You just want to make the film because it shocks me, you know what I mean? Yeah, but if you're saying, I have secured 70% of this money from blah, 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 blah. I just need 30%, sir, right, in a grant. Now, that's a different conversation. Yes, you did your homework. You went through a lot of discipline of trying to, 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 to convince other people, right, and, and so on and so forth, number one. The second element I'll ask is that, uh, have you got a distribution strategy plan? Most people who want grants at 100% will have none, zero. They'll just want to make the film and figure out how to sell it later, right? But if that person came in and said, hey, I have interest in this distributor in the US, that distributor in UK, whatever, these are the letters of intent. I understand you can't get a contract now, but at least you got letters of intent. It means you did your homework. It means your project was vetted and accepted by foreign distributors and platforms or Netflix or View or whatever, right? So all these things point to me that, ah, you've, you've at least made it look like if I send, uh, if, if, if I give this grant to you, it's going to be properly utilized to complete all this. I don't even have to vet the film or the story or read the script, you know, because we shouldn't be in a position where we are, you know, it's also objective that we, we say, oh, I don't like the script, I don't give you the grant. It's nonsense. So you don't happen to like romance films. That's too bad, you know. That's, that's, that's too narrow-minded. So you should look at all these other aspects that are more commercial. You did your homework, you've got distributor interest, you've, you've collected 70% of the, of the budget already, you just need a gap, it's called gap financing in our industry. Mm -hmm. I just need the gap finance and away we go. 
right? Now that makes the conversation easier to give a grant, right? Yeah. Then opposed to, uh, I have no idea whether your script is good enough or whatever, right? That's mm -hmm. essentially how I'd approach it, yeah. Yeah, uh, I guess it's also uh, in a way of saying where, you know, to, to show that you've really got skin in the game rather than yeah. just looking for yeah. handouts. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, if you want free money, you got to work for it, you know? <laughs> you work for it. Yeah, absolutely. You got to show that you should give it to me as opposed to the other guy. It's a competition because I did all my homework. I've got all these people behind me, right? Mm -hmm. And this is where it's going to go when it's made. Yep. It's yep. amazing, you know, for, people, for you to convince a distributor who has not seen your film before to commit before the film is, before the first day of principal photography. And you know what? It's even better when they like your idea so much, they'll even put up an advance, you know? Imagine mm. once they have an advance, then the distributor is, is caught ready. Now they have skin in the game because if they don't distribute your film well, they can't make back the advance. These are all the things that would help a grant program decide whether that project is legible or not. Mm -hmm. So sorry guys, sorry producers out there, got to do your homework, got to, got to make it work. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. The only thing that I would like to add is um, the confusion here has always been between uh, funding and financing. Right. And financing. Uh, grants are always necessary, especially for those who are starting up. You know, uh, Ching Yu will understand, and Leon too, uh, when we talk about seed capital, the startups. Yes, grants are really there, to be honest with you. We all know, even for the film industry and the ICT industry, it's for the startup. So it's a bit like, yes, it's free money, but free money with a purpose. It's the problem comes when some people get confused with that and financing. That's when you were talking about just now the 100%, <laughs> you know, without looking at the other things. But let's say if you are making something for the first time, you do need some seeding. And that's what the grant is all about. And if you look at other countries, script development and all that, were all funded by grants, simply because the script is developed with the financial assistance of BBC and all that. That's the whole purpose. Our problem here with the grant openers here is that that becomes financing. Now, financing to me is an investment-centric kind of uh, parameter, which is uh, what you've just mentioned. And that's where we've got to make the, to divide the line. That if you are in this business, remember the difference between funding and financing. Mm -hmm. Funds, grants is different altogether. <laughs> okay. So, so would, yeah. would you say that uh, the people who are raising finance in the Malaysian market right now has honed their skills, their salesmanship towards getting grants rather than to where they really need to get the, the real funding from? Mm. Well, to me, there are just uh, two funding uh, pools that they look at. One is the domestic funding pool. Now, even that funding pool is actually, is government, is, 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 is actually a government fund, right? Try to go to the normal banks in Malaysia for your mm. uh, financing. How many would actually say yes to you? Mm. So the history over the last decade or even more is just that for some reason, people are making films here with government money. Mm. Now, remember I was telling you earlier about the two support system. What I'm just referring is just one support system. The other support system comes from the independent side. Because these are the one where some semblance of that ideal producer that Leon was referring to do exist. Because they would assemble their funds from all over the world. And it so happens that these are small films. Now, I mean, there are certain examples. I mean, the one that I am familiar with is uh, the Lucky Harapan Dunia. Yep. Uh, 2014, I think, right? Well, what did the producer did? I mean, Sharon, right? I mean, she went all over, got money from people as diverse as the Hubert Balls Foundation in Holland, and then a little bit from God knows where, Italian <laughs> sources and Belgian and all that. But still, they get the money from Finas as well. So, you see, this is what this is all about, really. Uh, we call this assembling the funds. And I do know that even like Guang, which was mentioned earlier, I mean, they raised the money in what we call 
in the industry, um, well, in the, in the industry practical way, right? Because they're not depending just on one. Pre-sales were involved and they made yep. sales. I think even Jessie uh, Tiong, when she made uh, the kit from New York, uh, I mean, the money was assembled uh, through even Ma Seng <laughs> development right. property came into the picture. So right. there you are. Uh, whereas the one who get confused over that financing things, I mean, when you depend entirely on government funding, this is where the problem has come in. Because to me personally, what it has done is, it is not bringing out the real filmmakers out. These are just those who are trying to say, you know, I mean, like uh, one of the statements that I used to say in Finas, which I really got a battering for was, make money from your product, not in your production. Hmm. You know, I mean, if as a businessman, again, Ching Yu, I bring you back to the business. If I'm a factory producing a product, I want to make money from my product. Once everything is ready, then I worry about the marketing and all that. So that makes me conscious about, hey, I've got to start selling these things which I'm using my own money or which I'm using government money or a loan, right? But for the film industry, unfortunately, uh, some, I'm not talking about all, some are still treating this as their only source of income. Right. That this is their only source of, uh, what, what, what do you call it? Livelihood. Hmm. And this is why the real guys are not coming in. So there is like a specialist group that only knows, uh, you know, where the right grants are and all that. And they always appear again and again and again. I'm not saying that uh, they're not being clever or whatever, but they are just robbing the opportunities from the people who actually want to make films. Hmm. Of course, yeah. remember, if it's a government funding, public sector funding, your money, my money, my tax, you know, our taxpayers' money, it is about recycling, right? It's about nurturing somebody. Doesn't matter whether it's film or software developer. He's there, he gets the right boost, right? To come up with something new, pattern it, and then makes money from the product. Yeah. So, but, you know, that culture somehow is still a very heavy one here. And I always get into trouble for highlighting this. Um, not, not because, uh, you know, it's about certain people, but uh, it's a habitual thing. Uh, it, it's a culture that has been around for, well, and which can also explain why our film industry never, never really take off properly. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. But that's just my view. Yeah. So there's a stagnation uh, in the way where uh, this money only circulates within certain circles and thus also in the way uh, certain ideas mm. right, only gets uh, funded. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean uh, uh, to look at the practical side, and I think Leon can talk about this, I mean, War of the Worlds, I mean, that was one of the, uh, you know, one of the milestones that was created uh, a decade ago or more than a decade ago, but it's a co-production. Koreans were involved, Americans were involved, Malaysians were involved. So I think the sales and marketing, I mean, we learned a lot from that project. But at the same time, even if you mention something about, uh, let's take uh, some of the independent films. I mean, I like the way that uh, some independent producers are actually collecting the funds from all over. Yeah. They are getting funds from all, all over. And uh, although it's small money, but the point is that that is the reality. You could go to funds in Belgium, in uh, France, to even get my, you know. And uh, guess what? Even an uh, Indonesian film like uh, Malina, Madura in 4X and all that, guess what? It's partly funded by Astro, Astro Shaw. So Astro actually invests in, <laughs> you know, um, foreign films as well. And what about that uh, Singaporean film? Uh, what was it? Uh, the, the one about the gallows, The Apprentice. Yeah. About the, the retiring hangman who was uh, you know, uh, delegating the task to the new boy, right? I mean, right? Malaysian actors, but the funding also came partly from Malaysia. So you see, there are investors, but it's just a matter of having the right producer and all that. And all I'm saying is that I really uh, am trying to, uh, well, not to put the blame, but trying to pinpoint that it is those repeated grant openers who keep on coming back who thinks this is financing. And every time they get the money, they're preventing somebody else who could really do wonders 
from getting the money that would put Malaysia in a better economic, uh, you know, position or stature. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So that's um, that's the story. Yep. yep. Totally agree. Totally. Agree. Yeah. So I I see in our uh, comment section there's a lot of conversation uh, going on. <laughs> I'm I, I'm just going to share share the screen. Uh, so that maybe you all can also take a, a peek at it. Yeah. So R Ronnie over here, uh, he mentioned that uh, he did, what, uh, 39 goals or something? Uh, yeah, and that uh, he produced a film or something like that. Uh, yeah, he said uh, he's currently in angel funding. Uh, who are the buyers now in the, the market? He said free money is good. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then we've got Ismail Mohammed who says, Malaysia will never be ready. Both audience and directors are not ready. Well, Ismail, Ismail is someone that uh, you should be able to interview later because uh, he knows the history of all this film in Malaysia incentive. Mm. He actually made a proposal uh, while we were both at MDAC way back in 2003. And uh, actually nobody paid any attention to it. Uh, you know, um, Nobody paid attention to it until much, much later. Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, better for his mom to, you know, say it himself. Yeah. He's still, he's still there. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, his mom, by the way, if you're listening. Yep, yep. Hi, yeah. his mom. Uh, Rod, yeah, Rod, Ronnie says, Hollywood is funded by the mafia and the Jews. Well, in Malaysia, it's funded by the government. <laughs> yeah, uh, Rod, Ronnie says that he's, he's funded by Malaysia mafia. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then this Mao says, uh, Dato mentioned that this is an economic growth sector and contributor. We make shock sendiri movies that can't sell. The power is still with the audience cause they pay. Mm. Yeah. In in essence, uh, that is uh, that is uh, the reality of it. Because ultimately, to make a film, you need to have money, right? So an investor would want to give you the money if they know that the film is going to succeed. And the only way this, this, the film is going to succeed is if the audience wants to watch it. That's, the, that's, that's the, 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 the balance that filmmakers need to decide on how to manage when it comes to wanting to tell their own stories versus what, uh, having to tell stories that the audience wants. You know what I mean? Yep. And uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a perfect uh, scenario. Uh, even in countries like the U.S. and all that, where Hollywood's been around for over 100 years, they still struggle with that, as you can tell, yep. right? They still struggle with that. They spend they spend a lot of money on a film and nobody watches. They still do. That's right, yeah. You think that, you think that they have hits all the time, but they don't, right? Mm. So that's just part, of, part and parcel of being in this industry, yeah. right? Every industry has its special challenges. This is our challenge. That's, that's basically right. it. Yeah. yeah. But and to I say that, you know, oh, it's not going to happen. Only, you know, you can only make films that only other people want. I mean, I, I, I would say it's not so absolute. Like, you know, that's a balance here. Because guess what? Like what Steve Jobs say, don't make, don't make stuff that people, people think they want. Make them, make them stuff that they didn't realize they, they didn't want and now they want it. You know? So that happens too in our industry, right? A film turns up, nobody realizes that they, will, that they loved it. And they love it. And wow, it, it mm. happens, you know? It does yeah. happen too, so yeah. like that, <laughs> yeah. And I, I think this this also applies to uh, uh, the industry which I come from, which is oh, the, IT, yeah. Yeah. the training and the seminar industry, where oh, right, right. you know we we have a lot of speakers, trainers who have this core message that they want to share share to the market. You know that that story that they want to tell and inspire people. Mm. But the the fact is that you know at any uh, cross section point in time, there's there's only a certain thing that the market is willing willing to pay attention to. Right. So the question is, how is it that you can capture that market's attention first, and then draw them into your core story eventually right. in the upsell? Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 So uh, as we go through the comment section, so Ismail continues to say, so kalau mati yang tengok drama kat lima, produce it for them because TV stations pay. Cinemas will pay. Bilada box office, take that money and produce your personal film. Yeah. Uh, Can do that too, of course. Uh, 
Okay, and then he says Malaysian content creators need to learn about film content financing. And uh, yep, uh, he said, yep, that's right, Dion, get financing. And then he said, yes, where's the skin at? Skin in the game. Uh, yep. And then he said, oh, his mouth says, you take away censorship, we get too much skin. <laughs> you wish. <laughs> yeah, and Ron, Ronnie says we are the poor producer. Uh, let's say, yeah. uh, okay, need some honey, Ronnie. Uh, Ronnie says no money even to renew Fina's license. Honey <laughs> also need money. Mm-hmm. Fina's license, ah, uh, oh yo. <laughs> you know, talking about the skin thing, I remember once where I made the comment that uh, our cinema should feature as many local beauties as well, as much as we should feature local fruits, food, whatever, local men and women. I mean, this is to make sure that nobody grows up thinking that their ideal partner would be a blonde from California (laughs) or, you know, from the UK or something. So make sure our children grow up sort of desiring either, you know, local men or women, depending, and the cinema is the best way to do it. Because, you know, lots of nations falling in love with um, uh, Hindi stars, Bollywood stars for precisely the same reason. And now with Koreans, right? So yeah. see, things are working. But except that, rather than having uh, my son, uh, you know, sort of eyeing a Korean woman, I would prefer him to go after a Malaysian, regardless of, uh, you know, where... She's from. So, yep, yep cinema helps. Yeah. So, well, that's the skin uh, which pays dividends because uh, it keeps things in check. Yeah. And, uh, and Malaysia has so many beauties. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, continuing on in the comment section, this mouse uh, says, sell Chandoy outside. And then, when get enough, close shop and pay for license, la, Ronnie. <laughs> uh, well, I think Finas is trying to do its best. So, it's uh, well, we should see how <laughs> when they charge me for parking there. My goodness, I don't think they can charge actually. Did they give you a ticket, Ronnie? <laughs> see, oh, this mouse said we approached Petronas Kandato in our early days. Mm. Yeah, we did because we wanted Petronas to be uh, to become a, an investor. <laughs> And especially for documentary, when we approached Patronas, it wasn't so much for feature films, but it is to fund uh, documentary films. Because I was with Shell before, and Shell has a very sort of um, a very healthy documentary film unit based in London. Hmm. Interesting. So, okay, let's see. All local Chinese TV drama lover and Malay drama lover and film in 80s and 90s lover has seen my film, says Ronnie. Ah, that was, yeah, Ronnie's, uh, yeah, Ronnie was very active in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> His mouth says, I take uh, Fina's wow. money and put in fixed deposit better. <laughs> Fina's staff also do the same. <laughs> um. Okay. Ella says, I would like to know, do Finas understand uh, the economic structure of the film industry? Wow. Up to Leon to answer that. I mean, I... <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I think Dr. Kamil, you should answer that. <laughs> Does Finas know? Well, I think they understand the economic structure, except that um, under the processes there, um, a lot of... Um, those, those people with uh, some sort of vision or initiative. I mean, the hands can still be tight sometimes. You know, so that will probably explain the situation uh, that, that, that we are in sometimes. Uh, and then uh, Ismail says, uh, I keep, keep on preaching Dato Kamil's idea on book optioning. Use our grants for that. That will push our content out. Uh, that is about something which uh, Ismail came up with uh, a long time ago when after trips to Los Angeles, we found that 98% of, well, 
or films made in Hollywood are all basically based on books. Mm. So whereas Malaysia, we were in pursuit of originality, which is good on its own, but yeah. if you don't have them, but uh, why not we go on the books options as well? Because uh, when you option a book, you're already optioning uh, half a script, uh, you know, or at least um, the script, the, the story is already there, especially when it's a bestseller. Then you can attract two kinds of audiences. One is those who have read the book and the other, those who would want to see it because of word of mouth. So it's all about a marketing strategy that you get books that are popular and turn them into films or drama or whatever. Yeah. Okay. So at the same time, you will also give revenue to the authors. So it's all about another way of sort of circling the economic pie around. Yeah. So could, could you uh, uh, define book optioning uh, for those uh, of us? Book well? option is that somebody has written a good book and I want to turn it into a film. So I go to the author and say that, okay, uh, for 10,000 ringgit, uh, I will buy the option from you. And that comes with like uh, their option within two years, I will turn it into a film. Ah, okay. So, so in financing terms, it is literally an options contract, the right ah, to buy. Correct. Okay. And if we did... They could give the option to somebody else. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. I, I broke up a bit from there, but uh, moving on, we have uh, Ronnie saying, bro, you go back as DG Finas, I make film. And then, uh, yeah, his, his smile says, book optioning will get our movies to the Oscars. I truly believe that. And then Ronnie says, I would rather win China. I <laughs> So it's, it's, it's very interesting. And uh, do you think that uh, in terms of uh, the mentality of uh, book authors and uh, maybe even screenwriters, uh, are they aware of uh, the legal framework that is available uh, to them? And you know, even like uh, what you mentioned uh, on options contracts. Yeah, I think, <coughs> excuse me, yeah. I think most are aware, <coughs> like, um, sorry, except that the, it is not a common thing for books to be translated to films. <coughs> excuse me, that's, that's not COVID, that's more like dry throat. <laughs> I am uh, COVID free, yeah. All right. So um, I think that's only because it has never been a common um, culture, I mean, for want of a better word, for filmmakers to actually base their films uh, on books. Not yet, anyway. There are some, and those who have actually um, have been successful. I remember a couple of years ago, uh, there was a, a box office hit called Kumbak um, Windu or something, it was a Malay film, and it was based in a book. And, um, and the best thing was, after the film was made, successful, and the book had a second round of printing as well, because everybody wanted to go back to the books. So economically, it has already been proven, and this is why the West is always doing this, when they option books, when they turn books into films, you are actually creating a market or engaging the market that is already familiar with that, that is will be familiar with your final product. Mm. So again, you know, it's a marketing strategy. And just like uh, the other way that we were looking at it, and Ismail mentioned it earlier, uh, we were thinking about what happens if Malaysia were to do its own version of, uh, let's say, uh, Wolf Totem, that Chinese novel. It's a China novel, but who says it can be turned into a Malaysian version? Now, what will happen after you have made it? You can sell it to China. China will want it. They will be curious, hey, how come these Malaysians, how do they do our classic novel, you know? 
mm-hmm. or you could get a story, you know, a classic story, or the, for the same reason, uh, let's say we make our own version of Madame Bovary, which is a French novel. Can you imagine where can we actually market it to? France, and for you know, you could even get French money. That is the nature of how you and all that with the production itself. Hmm. But for Malaysia itself, let's face it, how many good books do we actually have screaming out to be turned into a film, right? Plenty. Hmm. If, like what I was saying earlier about the horizontal and the vertical, and if you get it all sorted out from that marketing point of view, uh, what you will find is, you will get a situation where the books will already have its audience, especially some of the classic novels, then they would all be able to get uh, audience one and they would into a film. And the best part about the book is that it's already ready with characters, with the storyline. Uh, I mean, and all you have to do is to have a good screenwriter to adapt it. Mm. So uh, this is something which is uh, not uh, new because it has um, I think most of the other film industries, I think in the UK, um, US, Europe, they've all get their films done mainly on books. It's always based on, you know, books that have already been published. Hmm. And we should do it here too. We should do it here too. I mean, uh, what you will create in effect will be authors who now say, good, I'm now... My book I've written, that's not meant for the cinema. It was meant for the literary. Right, right? Just like musicians are supposed to be continuously playing music. Uh, but you look at those, what's happening here. Some of the best musicians from RTM are now retired. Hmm. Right? Why are not, uh, I mean, why aren't we, uh, you know, using, uh, you know, t- uh, taking care of them? Uh, when I say taking care, I mean, it's not so much uh, on the charity side. If the demand is correct, right? Because remember, the government can control the demand factors. Mm. Yes, it's demand. The supply is already there. Yep. Uh, so why should age 60, well, I know I'm talking a bit about myself too, but, uh, you know, why should age 60 be a, a restriction on a writer? or a news reader from the, you know, RTM or Astro or wherever, Media Prima, right? They should be in the system for as long as they can do, right? Uh, writers, yes? I mean, authors, musicians, what else? Fashion designers, plenty. You are in the training business, trainers. You know, I mean, uh, ex-teachers. That's also the other reason why I wanted the, um, when I was in Finas, the... Uh, archives, the archival um, focus to be taken seriously because the minute when you go into a strategic effort in creating our own national archives, yeah, I'm talking about digital archives, mm-hmm. you imagine how many retired history teachers we have, we can employ for them to do the, uh, what what you call it, the meta, the meta, metadata uh, compilation because what we have are just images but one day you need to retrieve them according to keywords and all that right yep right? and is that new no i know in singapore that's what they did with the uh, Sing- the singapore archives hmm. they hired all these retired uh, history teachers who can see one photograph and then can write maybe two sentences oh that photograph was based in 1964 or whatever right mm-hmm. that is for our children's children's children Yep. Yep. At the same time, it is also an economic, uh, you know, generator. Yeah. So uh, it comes back again to my horizontal and verticals, uh, the one that I was telling you earlier. Yeah, uh, so I think I would like to say, yeah, there are musicians that I know, who you know, superb musicians who are now uh, looking for a job or having no job. But you, if you have a demand environment that results in all the time you are clear about the music industry, you know, everything is all matured as what uh, you were referring to earlier. All these people will be there. Hmm. They are there. I mean, why are we wasting all these assets, all these talent, all these, uh, 
you know, all this uh, group of people. Yep. And that's why I think the creative industry, if properly uh, strategized, if properly set up, I mean, it will be that great economic engine that we're talking about. Yep. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's an interesting point you, you shared about uh, having archives. It's, uh, it's really understanding that uh, there's great value within the history of our creative industry that you know, we can pass on generations after generations if we really want to build a solid foundation uh, mm -hmm. for, the, for this uh, industry. And yeah, it, it certainly is a waste uh, that you've got so many talented uh, creatives out there who, who, whom we are not tapping into their reservoir of uh, knowledge and experience. Gotcha. Yeah. So it, Ismail shares that, you know, I believe that we sh should put some skin internationally to put Malaysia on the map. Uh, Ho Yuhang did this. We became a co-director uh, in a foreign film. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, um, that's from the independent side that I was referring to. So the, 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 there are two support systems. The support system right now that I think has a lot of flaws is the one that is supporting the mainstream side of things. But for the independent, uh, I think more out of necessity because uh, we must understand that uh, may not have the right cables into the, you know, the, uh, how shall we say, into the ecosystem yet. So they have to find funding. But I think they are behaving more of a businessman than the other side mm. because they know it's like uh, it's your product that sells. And it's also about uh, putting your name at film festivals, right? I mean, sometimes you say, oh, I make an art film. Nobody wants to see it in Malaysia. But if you ask the filmmaker themselves, it's about, yes, it's okay. But my film is shown at the New York Film Festival or at Toronto or New Delhi or Tokyo. The point is that they know my name. Hmm. Uh, that's how Yasmin Ahmad, for instance, you know, we talk about archives. Uh, who was the one who restored her film? It wasn't Malaysia, the country of origin. The Japanese restored and digitized her film. Wow. Right? So that's why I tweet. Seriously, by another country. Hmm. Yeah. So, different environment, no? Yeah. No, no, yeah. I had to get, uh, I'm moving from the car to the house. Sorry about that, guys. Right. No problem. So, you know, I mean, um, that's what we're saying. I mean, uh, it, and also about fame. And uh, well, actually, it's not so much about fame. It's more about creating a name, a niche. So uh, uh, remember that Indonesian film, The Great Redemption. Uh, I mean, okay, yep. I mean, it was done the right way, uh, right time, and it was full of uh, good stuff. And the next thing you know, uh, who's the actor that he was? Um, well, one of the actors there uh, went into Star Wars. Both of them, actually. Yeah, Both of them. Going. That's right. They went into that. And uh, don't forget also that there was... A John Wick. <laughs> going to John Wick. Yeah. So, uh, but that's what I should be. Because these guys, I mean, if our filmmakers uh, get well-known in other countries and all that, fine. They are actually carrying the Malaysian flag. And there's one more sort of to convince that um, if they were to buy a Malaysian product, all they have to do is refer back to the film. I mean, uh, let's face it. I mean, there are a couple of uh, Americans that I met who would never agree with, uh, well, I suppose with Trump, <laughs> that, uh, you know, Iran is an evil country because they have seen Iranian films. Hmm. And once you have seen Iranian films, you find hey, what is so evil about these guys. You go to a shopping mall in Tehran, it looks like any shopping mall in America, except there, no one is wearing a miniskirt <laughs> or you know, showing yeah, in hot pants, but they're all wearing the hijab. So what's the diff? Two different cultures. And don't forget the Iranian film that won the Academy Award uh, a few years back uh, called The Salesman was based on an American play. Huh, Ching Yu? Yep. Uh, that was one of the greatest surprises that year. An Iranian film, mm -hmm. but based on an American play. Mm. It was by Arthur Miller, which is one of the most famous uh, American playwrights. Yep. So, can you imagine the, 
the reaction of the average. Okay, it wasn't a million dollar box office success. But you look at the typical American who's on the verge of saying Iran is, you know, Iran is a terrorist threat mm -hmm. or whatever. Then he watches the salesman. Then he says, what the hell? Number one, it is based on our play, but they're just setting it in an Iranian, uh, you know, the Iranian, uh, what about the next? Yeah. Complex. Yes. Uh, that's what I meant. We take Madame Bovary, French classic, or we can take even whatever three musketeers or whatever. Right? And don't forget, the Magnificent Seven came from the Japanese Seven Samurai. Mm. When they made the film Seven Samurai, it was supposed to be a Japanese film. Then somebody in Hollywood saw it and said, hmm, if I convert that to cowboys, then it becomes something else. So one classic spun off another classic, you know? Um, well, I mean, that's the beauty. And especially now with the digital uh, world, borderless and all that, it makes it uh, possible for anyone to achieve all this. Unlike uh, maybe 20 years ago, where when you make a film, it's really about a film strip, right? Yeah. Use cameras yeah. got to process the film, photograph, and you process for a few days before it comes back to you. Today is an instantaneous environment. Yep. So, yeah. yep. so let's get back to the comment section. I see mm -hmm. that uh, there's quite a conversation going on over there. Uh, so, Ismail shares that uh, we should make all content drama, kat lima, independent films, mainstream movies, and etc. Segmentize them and fun across. And uh, Ronnie says, I am a retired lecturer. Hire me, please. So uh, guys, uh, take note. <laughs> and uh, Ismail shares, uh, we talk about Korean movies a lot. We should put money in their production, get technology transfer, and then make our movies. Singapore does that just to uh, and uh, yeah, just do it to put Malaysia on the map. Uh, forget about the Oscars right now, build the right foundations first. Uh, Ronnie says, We cannot write international humor story, bro. Uh, what, what do you think about that? Well, for me, uh, I would say, um, you know, if we want to make an impact overseas we should try to go for low-hanging fruit first, you know what I mean? Mm. Low-hanging fruit in terms of the genres, you know? And the kind of genre that would be, you know, that, that translates across all cultures are things like action, horror, you know, things like that. And uh, we, we, and that's why The Raid did so well, right? The Raid Redemption came from Indonesia, it was completely an Indonesian film, but it was a hit worldwide because people could, could, could enjoy watching a crazy, edgy, you know, action film like that. So similarly, uh, that the, one of the hardest genres to translate in any culture is humor. Mm -hmm. You know, it's humor, it's difficult, right? It's, 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 you know, it's difficult for an American to write a humor film for Malaysia, right? Just as it's for a Malaysian writer to write for America. So I, I would generally say, um, if you have finite resources and time, right? And you have one shot, uh, maybe humor isn't the way. You know, isn't isn't what you need to do, right? Try try to reach out for other uh, uh, you know genres that that have more uh, universal appeal across borders. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So. Yep. That, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yep. So we have uh, Hanzi who shares Kiko Wise, Tetap, and Yayan are uh, those uh, Indonesian actors. Right, that's that's from the, the guys from the the Red Redemption. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, year non chess Shue did it with American classics. So I think uh, he meant uh, Uwe Uwe Ajishari. Yes, he did. Um, like um, I think the film Hanyot was based on the um, Alamaya's uh, folly. I think there was one of the books. Uh, which is based on the French. And I think because of that, I think they did get a French release or is it a European release? But uh, we need to confirm. But this is a very few and far between, uh, you know, where we adapt foreign novels into uh, what I call into the Malaysian context. Mm. Okay. 
then uh, yeah, Ismail shares, our humor is more language based. What works is slapstick. Charlie Chaplin proved that. Mm, That's why Korean comedy films is a hit. Right. If anything, Charlie Chaplin proof is that the cinema, the moving picture is a visual medium. And to have much dialogue in a film, most people try to avoid because as a medium, it is really about visual. Hmm. Uh, it's what you see. So that's why in Charlie Chaplin, uh, no I mean, you know the story without even hearing a single word of dialogue. Mm -hmm. Yep, just yeah. like uh, yeah, uh, Rowan oh, Atkinson sure. and uh, Mr. Right. Bean. So. Right. Yeah. That's that's more. That's like it's like humor with miming. Yep. Yep. I think my connection broke off a bit. So who else? The, the, uh, the night <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, since uh, uh, Leon, you're, you're on the ground and uh, Camille, you're advising uh, Max Men TV, how, how is the film uh, industry currently uh, adapting to the new norm, including the cinemas? Uh, as we see a lot of them, like GSC, TGV, uh, MBO Cinemas, where MBO Cinemas, even the CEO came out to, well, in, in a way, back uh, uh, the public to please uh, purchase uh, from them. Yeah. So, yeah, how, how is it like on the ground? How, how uh, do, does the film industry adapt to the new norm? Well, I think the writing was on the wall when COVID first struck, in any case, um, that um, the cinema will have to comply. I think it, it opened up for a while and I must confess I managed to see Tenet before the whole thing closed down again. So um, yep, it was uh, social distancing and all that. Personally though, I mean I feel that cinemas should still be allowed to open. That's just my personal view but with the um, you know the seats like Okay, I mean, they, they still won't make money. I mean, a, a 200-seater where you could only allow 20 or 25 to come in. Uh, but I still think that uh, they should just go for it rather than to close it completely. Um, but that's just my view. And uh, I also have a personal reason for liking it, even though in a very transitory way, because then only those who really want to watch the movie will go and watch the movie. And I don't have, you know, a lovey-dovey couple sitting next to me where the boyfriend is trying to impress the girlfriend, you know, by talking as though he's at a, you know, at a race horse track, you know, trying to impress the girlfriend, right? Because I like total silence uh, when watching a film. So in a way, during that little period where <laughs> when GSC was open, I really enjoyed it. I mean, I must confess, although in a slightly, uh, well, I wouldn't say perverted way, but in a slightly self, uh, you know, self-indulgent way, right? Mm -hmm. But the other thing I miss also is that the, Jap the Japanese film festival that should have started. I was looking forward to all the films oh. and then the cinemas are closed. But I think they are overreacting on the cinemas mm -hmm. because if you can allow 25 people at weddings and, uh, you know, 25 max at a function, I mean, why should the cinema be the victims, right? Yeah. So, I feel like... I mean, in cinema, people are just sitting there. They're not even interacting, hmm. you know? That's right. Yeah. And the yeah. best part is, like I said, I mean, you are watching a film in peace. The rest will have to keep quiet because even the boyfriend cannot sit next to the girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, watch Tenet as well uh, in IMAX with my girlfriend. And yeah. I, it, it was well, such a weird separated, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was such a weird experience where you know, I, I'm the IMAX theater is so huge, and then the seats are huge as well, and then you've got this huge gap uh, right. between me and my girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I I actually wanted to uh, tell um, GSC, especially because I met uh, the GSC people um, earlier, that what they should propose to the government is that it's cinema 
but make it a 24 hour operation. Mm. Non stop. Right. Yeah, non stop. And try to have what is known as double bills to film at the same time. But right. keep SOP. Everybody must go in with a mask and temperature checks. Everything is the same. Why? Because what is the logic of having a, you know, a, a wedding where you say maximum 25? I think at one point it was 50. What's the difference? Except that I was explained by somebody who is knowledgeable about this thing that the cinema is what you call it, is a closed area. So things tend to move around. But isn't that the same thing in a shopping mall as well? Right? I mean, uh, you're in a shopping mall, so you could, you know, the icon, the duck system. So I was looking actually for more innovative ways by the cinema operators to say, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, 25 maximum. Or you go on a proportion, right? Where it's a 500 seater, you can go maybe 50 maximum. But you're compensated by having uh, your screening time sort of, uh, well, 24 hours is basically what I'm going to say. 24, if you want to watch films. And maybe drive-ins, try to invest in drive-ins as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because at the end of the day, I mean, no matter how much I could watch things here at home, I still love the cinema screen. Mm. Yep. I still love the impact of being in a cinema. Yep. Uh, as a very selfish son of a bitch kind of way. <laughs> because I've always liked to watch films alone. Yep. And normally I would watch it on the last day. Because I know on the last day, very few people would turn up. Yeah. Uh, so... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting seeing the rise of uh, drive-in cinemas as well, and you know different industries are embracing the drive-in culture. Today's news was about uh, a Penang nasi kanda place also doing drive-through kind, mm. kind of things. Yeah, but uh, like what Leon uh, mentioned just now, <coughs> where will cinema move from here? Maybe at the end of the day, it's not about cinema halls anymore. Mm. It could be a pop, <coughs> you know, hologram type. Those are all the the the, the signposts are all there. Mm. Yep. Because now you have augmented reality. Uh, sorry, the other one was it virtual reality? Mm -hmm. Maybe the new cinema is people wearing not only the mask but headsets. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. Then you so could watch, um, you know, things in the virtual reality environment. And why not? I mean, uh, even for games now, they're using headsets. They're using VR, uh, what they call this spatial computing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wore a head glass once and technically I was on a lift. It took me up to the 44th floor. And then when the lift opens, I saw, I looked down and it was like 44 buildings down there. Yep. I knew I was actually not there. But you see how jarring it was. And can you imagine horror films of the future? It's yeah. A yeah. I can imagine your reaction being like, uh, there's this famous clip of when people were first exposed to moving pictures. Mm. And then they were shown uh, a train coming towards them in black and white. And everybody was like screaming. Ducks for cover, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. Yeah. So it's the same thing. So... A horror film. Can you imagine uh, Friday the 13th? Jason is right behind you. <laughs> so, which means that in the future, uh, most cinemas like that, or what we call the virtual reality theaters, will always be built next to the specialty center or KPG. Mm. Because the number of people who are going to have heart attacks. Will be <laughs> yep. That's another new business model, right? Right? Uh, complex. Yep. Yeah. It's all about the ecosystem. <laughs> yeah. So sh share, sharing again uh, in the comment section, uh, Hanzi and the last shares. I just finished shooting a film with Aflin Shauki. Uh, we just have to soldier on through the SOP. Yeah. And then Ismail Mohammed shares, we should pay attention more to the second screen. Content makers need to explore seriously how to make money this way. The internet has less censorship. Self-regulation should be emphasized. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, R Ronnie is hopping on the hologram idea and says, I will start hologram movie cinema. And Ismail, Ismail says, I want to watch Tenet with your girlfriend too. Uh, I'll, I'll pass on the message, Ismail, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep you posted on what she shares. Uh, 
cinema will be dead soon. Air Asia also. Very. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Uh, this is what happens when uh, you know they work from home for too long. So, <laughs> <it> is, <laughs> this this uh, is where all their creativity goes to, yeah, yeah. So yes, yeah, so Leon, yeah. So what are your thoughts on uh, adapting to the new norm for the film industry? Uh, I think from the perspective of a filmmaker to to tell these stories. Yeah, you have to accommodate for new ch new channels, right? Like, for example, not not uh, the the chances of your film going cinematic is not as high as it used to, you know, and stuff like that. But ultimately, the the the, the discipline and the processes needed to get finance to 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 conceptualize and then to develop and then to get financing and then to get distribution or commercialization is the same, right? It's not going to change. It's not going to mean that COVID-19 has made these things less important. If anything else, it makes it more important, right? So, so um, um, that shouldn't change at all. If anything else, it should be even more uh, em emphasized either through the policies that we have to move the industry or even the industry people themselves, you know, uh, individually or collectively, right? Um, the, the, of course, the, the main thing that worries the industry is that uh, Will cinema chains survive this? You know, they they will definitely will have to figure out how to survive. You know, mm -hmm. because they 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 don't really make films. Most of them don't. You know, so so they they are dependent on films being put on your screens, right? Uh, but but the filmmakers still continue to have a plethora of array of different options to to put their 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 content uh, out there for the public. You know, uh, just needs more more focus and, and discipline. Uh, but I agree with Dr. Kamil. I hope that cinema comes back. You know, it should. It's it's it's. There's nothing quite like it. You know, the the social, the not just being watching a film on your own, but also the social experience of watching a film. You know, it's it's also very exciting, right? Like like uh, you know, I mean, I can tell you that the experience I felt in some films in a packed audience later on, I saw it again in Netflix. It's not the same. Mm. <laughs> it's just not the same. You know. Yeah. And all of it happened not just because of what was on screen, but just the environment of it. Yeah, that's that's something very magical and special. Oh, yeah. Having a shared I mean, experience with strangers. Yeah, it's weird, right? Yeah. Uh, we are all social animals at the end of the day, whether we like it or not. It's true. Uh, you know, it's quite different when you see a f the first Star Wars films in the pack cinema than seeing it alone <laughs> three years yeah. later on Netflix. You know. Uh, yeah, you know, stick stuff like that. So yeah, I, I, I just like I said. I mean, the the main message I want to convey is that filmmakers and the government government uh, organizations that support the film industry or the media or screen industry really uh, real should 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 uh, realize that all the more we, we need to be more vigilant about trying to 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 to, to, to boost our industry. You know why? Because if anything else. The media industry, the, the the content industry, was is one of the only industries that did very well in COVID nine during the COVID nineteen pandemic, because more and more people want to see more stuff because they're stuck at home, right? So that's the iron, the bitter irony of it, you know. But at the same time, yeah, you still need to, to go out and shoot, and it's difficult because of social distancing. So, yeah, so so ra rather than just say, hey, it's hard to shoot and forget about it. I think government should work hand in hand with the film industry to figure out ways to make more content while still keeping to the pandemic uh, scenarios, you know? Uh, and some countries are doing very well. I'll give you an example, the UK, who is a terrible scenario, right? The second lockdown and all that, yet its industry is thriving because the government made very smart decisions, for example. And, and, and I want to do this for our own government, to be honest. The UK government actually offers insurance on the pandemic. So now filmmakers can shoot without worrying about what happens if someone gets infected, right? Because you can take out insurance from the government, pay a premium, and that covers your shoot. And guess what? An American producer would love it because, hey, now I can shoot in the UK because, you know, I, I can take out insurance, right? And I, have, and I want to tell our government, you know, Tato Kamil, that it costs almost nothing to just offer insurance to both domestic and foreign filmmakers. Right to come and shoot in Malaysia or to shoot in Malaysia, it offers almost nothing, especially if your COVID nineteen uh, SOPs are strong. Right, mm -hmm. it costs almost nothing. 
you should just immediately do that and announce it through Hollywood Reporter. Hey, we are open for business. We've got insurance, and we're damn good at running our our, our productions. In, with, uh, you know, in, a, in the middle of a pandemic, that's an amazing signal to send out to the world, right? Mm -hmm. And again, it costs nothing. It costs nothing to set up insurance, mm -hmm. right? Because it's a good chance that you're not even going to pay out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so you, you've got to have good underwriters uh, over there. Yep. Yeah. 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 And Ismail shares, uh, we need more distributors. Distributors that can create a platform and package content that can sell. Right. I, I think we have a lot of distributors. You know, I mean, you just need to go to a trade show or a film market and you can see that it's all packed with distributors from all over the world, you know. I, 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 well, I agree that, yeah, we, we need good, smart, sharp uh, distributors both outside the country and inside. I, I think it's still about filmmakers and, and people who are supporting the film industry to, to, to understand and, and, and become more, um, you know, communicate with distributors more and learn more about what is it that makes uh, selling easier or better or more effective or more impactful, you know. And, and uh, I, I have a feeling that you know, even today, I still talk to reporters, I mean, sorry, sorry, to, to producers who, you know, who, who, who think about the distribution last when it's so weird, right? It should be the first thing you should think of because are you going to get your film out? You know, but it's just something that many of them don't want to deal with because it's just so, you know, it's, it's not their world, right? It's finance and logistics and corporate, you know. Uh, so we, we should try to bridge the gap as fast as we can, frankly, you know. And again, all the solutions I try to put forward all the time is uh, uh, low-hanging fruit solutions. You don't have to put up hundreds of millions of dollars or build infrastructure, you know. Insurance policies can be sorted out in a couple of weeks and announced a month later. Simple as that. No censorship. It's just an announcement or press on the press, you know. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, interaction with distribution is just forums, right? Forums and workshops and things like that cost you nothing, but effectively increases the industry's economic engine potential. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Yep. So, yeah. So, you know, it's getting late. So what are some of your final words uh, that you'd like to share about the current state of the Malaysian uh, film and creative industry and what's the way forward uh, for them? Uh, Dato Kamil, uh, you, you can start first. Okay, to start the, the ball rolling on this one, uh, we have touched um, on that wish list, but uh, if you could just sum it up, um, this time of the pandemic is actually the best time to review our policies and look at our track record. Uh, if the whole intention is to come up with new policies, especially post-pandemic, but still tempered with what we call the economic prerogative, this is the best time. This is also the best time uh, to do things like the archiving. Because since we are less busy making films right now, why not we do an inventory, a stock take of what we have done over the last, uh, what, uh, uh, 50, 60 years or whatever, it doesn't matter. And also this is the time to encourage people who can write, uh, with experience, their memoirs or whatever, give some funding to help them put you know, onto the line, you know, uh, some incentives to write uh, books digitally or physical. Uh, well, because uh, in some ways, that's what COVID is all about. I mean, it's a time of, of, re of reflection for most of us. And it can happen on an economic level, spiritual level, and on many levels. Uh, but as a country, you see what happens. Something natural has come along called COVID virus. And actually, part of our normal problems that are associated with Malaysia has suddenly sort of um, slowed down, uh, which shows like as though, you know, the divine nature of things, right? That COVID has come along. Maybe for us to just look at ourselves. This is the best time actually to start looking back at uh, what actually have we done, what have we achieved? And this is very important for if you want to carve out the future, right? So from all angles, I mean, new business models. So in other words, this is the time to not to, um, uh, not to disallow opinions to come in, you know, like uh, you don't 
select. You're not a selective, you know, you're not going for selective opinions or some thought processes. Let everybody come up with their own views in their particular sector. Like if you ask me personally, I mean, I'm hoping that uh, even now, right, for the relevant people in the ministry and all that, uh, I feel like sharing, yes. I mean, I would like to share, uh, what, 18 years of uh, involvement in the creative industry. But I'll, tell, I'll be honest with you, no one has done that, right? No one has even asked or consulted about what happened. So they keep recycling the same thing again and again. And whereas I could save them, well, I mean, I'm not looking at all sectors, but at least at some specific sectors, I mean, we could be the bridge between the policies that are emerging and what has happened in the past. Mm. Uh, why am I doing this? Because I'm a Malaysian and I want to look at uh, the future of the film industry, the creative industry in ways which uh, perhaps I think some may have overlooked, right? But no one has actually approached me to come and speak on a legitimate basis. Everything that I have to say now is, for example, tonight through your, your Tinker's Lounge. Okay, a few tweets here and there, a few FB. But the real message I'm saying is that, hey, before I die, I can actually share a lot of things mm -hmm. with you. I mean, whoever that you may be. Uh, but the thing is that you must also be serious about it. Mm -hmm. If you're not serious about it, maybe that's why things are like this. Because we have this capacity uh, to do wonders, and yet at the same time, we are still going back to this thing called regurgitation, recycling of all items, which, you know, still costs money. If you believe time is money, I, uh, well, what I'm saying basically is that continuity should move, right? I mean, when the aeroplane was invented by the Wright brothers, it wasn't that, it was just that they did everything themselves. They took, what, uh, 600 years of history, right? All the designs by Da Vinci right? and all the people who have died putting wings on their shoulders and jumping off cliffs, right? All that study culminated in that fateful day when the Wright brothers finally flew, uh, what you call it, the Kitty Hawk or something, off the ground. The first flight. Ditto for many other inventions, many other innovations, and especially now, where we are talking about innovation, creativity, and all that. So there must be continuity. But what I've seen so far, especially for the creative industry, an industry which I am familiar with, and I can challenge anyone who thinks, uh, not to say who thinks I'm not, but who, can, who wants to sort of give a different view. Uh, this is the industry that we know that can do wonders for Malaysia. And it is a bit sad to see that no one is interested in that continuity. Uh, you know, they keep on coming back. When I hear something, I say, oh, Lama, that was discussed already in that time, you know. Yeah, well, even something as simple as Oscars. You think it's new? We prepared the paper in 2014. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you really want to go into that area now, which is fine, but let's say, instead of announcing it as if it's a new thing, let's say that you look back at what has happened since 2014, and then we carve out the new strategy, remember? Strategy is a strategy, the tactic is a tactic, and all we are doing now is talking about the tactics, mm. but bereft of that overall strategy. So mm. that's my wish. So if they use this COVID time to reflect thing, and you know, and I can even, share this for free. I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, getting back to the DG job or something. It's just to give out, to share. Yep. Uh, then, uh, you know, we can carve out uh, 20, 30, within 20 years, can revamp the industry and achieve wonderful things. But the most important thing, I would still stand by my horizontal and vertical, um, uh, what do you call it? Well, it wasn't a theory. It's a... Um, historic, uh, it's a, what do you call it? My, uh, well, concept. That conceptual framework. Because I think that was safe and is not original idea. Singapore is doing it. Europe is doing it. You know, even Vietnam is doing it. Mm -hmm. 
Bodia is doing it because I know because we still have friends there and don't talk about South Korea anymore without understanding that strategic element. All that Malaysia has been talking about with a lot of pride is their tactical action. But everybody ignores the strategic thrust that came with it. Yeah. Yeah. So I rest my case. <laughs> okay, wonderful. I mean, yeah. okay, I have to laugh because this is, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's a Santai Tetare kind of talk. Yeah. But really, from the senior side, I mean, I hope that uh, the powers that be stop recycling, stop regurgitating, because contrary to what they may have been advised, there are still people around who knows how this economic uh, continuity or what you call it this to up the ante right on yep. the economic power of the creative industries uh, i mean we are still around yep yep yeah so ronnie ronnie says you know see how my brother loved this uh, industry we support you bro <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then his smile says but that's life ronnie only for the few care mm. and then uh yeah, and then uh, both uh, Ronnie and uh, Ismail says, DG is good, bro. DG is wonderful. Change the industry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, yeah. Oh, so, God. hopefully, through our conversations, uh, you know, we can help plant and seed the idea and uh, facilitate more mm -hmm. uh, collaborations and to really uh, ignite this uh, vision uh, that you have. Yeah, perhaps we can discuss further in the future and see how we can connect and facilitate this. Yes. And, uh, yeah. And what what about you, uh, Leon? What are your final words about the current state of the Malaysian film industry and uh, its way forward? My final words are, Dr. Kamil said everything. Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Yeah. So much uh, time has been taken to... Uh, reinvent the wheel, right? Just regurgitate and reinvent the wheel as if, hey, it's my idea. It's, this is not a time for ego. Yep. This is a time to convert uh, economic opportunities, right? And if people say, show me your economic opportunities, there are scores of countries where their filmmaking and screen industry is contributing hugely to the economy and employment and careers, you know? And at the same time, adding to the depth of human civilization through arts, through the arts. You know, very few industries can say that, you know, to be honest, very few, you know. Uh, and and uh, I remember Greg Kut, right? Remember Dr. Kamil Greg who was my late partner in Dragon State. He was the guy, he used to tell me in his office in LA, he used to say, name me an industry where you, where you could, your, your, your product could potentially yield like 2,000%, you know, of, of, in, in terms of profit, right? Because you pick a film like uh, Get Out, right? Which was made for 5 million bucks, right? And it made, what, 300 million? You know, things like that. Very few uh, industries allow even that to happen. Now, it's not just luck. It's a combination of making sure that the government knows what it's doing, the industry knows what it's doing, and the relationships overseas, right? The, the general larger global network that you are a part of is beneficial to you and there's healthy contribution in both ways, you know? And like I said, it's not easy, obviously, but, you know, try to make the simple things work first, right? Yeah. Remove censorship, put in an insurance plan for productions. I know I keep saying this, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Do the simple stuff first, not the complex, or oh, how are we going to change the whole industry? Don't, you know, simple stuff like that. The road to the Oscars is paved with actually simple steps first, not complicated steps, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of it is not even you. It's actually the, we may be talking about people who aren't even born yet who is going to make a difference in our industry. Mm -hmm. like, not even us sometimes. Right. You know? and that's why those filmmakers are right now probably four or five years old. And what right. I'm telling you is now their imagination must be shaped now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And I'll give you an example. I was a corporate guy. And so Dr. Kamil also was a corporate guy. But we are in this industry. Why? Because when we were young, we were inspired by this industry. We were inspired by, by, by film and by music and by art and everything else. And ultimately, we moved from a corporate career to one of this industry, which is very volatile and doesn't give you a lot of uh, predictable <laughs> or stability, but it feeds the soul, you know? Very few industries allow you to do that, right? So the idea is you can still keep this industry growing, right? And, and sustainable, 
just make do the simple steps first, mm-hmm. you know, and then let stand back and watch it all flourish. Mm-hmm. In my opinion, yeah, I believe we can do that. Okay. Wise one. Wise Wonderful. One. Yes. So yes, everybody, yeah, uh, do the simple things, and you know, we'll just give a a final look at the comment section uh, right now. Uh, Ismail says, create another industry peril. Leave this one behind. Clap. Thanks, Dato, for fighting the good fight from Henzi. And then uh, Ismail says, just don't go peaceful into the night, Dato. <laughs> <laughs> Henzi yeah. says, rage, rage against the dying light. <laughs> right. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah. It's a pity that I'm CEO right now. Otherwise, uh, Ronnie, Ismail, Henzi, we could all go to Tetare with Leon and Chigyo. <laughs> on early morning. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 in the mood for Roti China now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For me too. <laughs> yeah. It was the frozen one, so I don't know how long it was tall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ro- Ronnie says to survive forty years in the industry, it's not easy, but we did it. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. So I mean, if there's anyone out there who feels that you know you can contribute to this cause, you know the resources are here. You know, we've got the wisdom of uh, Dato Kamil and uh, the forward thinking uh, thoughts of uh, Leon and uh, you know, dirty and hands-on in the industry. And of course, our wonderful uh, people who have uh, joined us during this session, you know, feel free to connect with each other and make a difference in this industry. So you know, uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, our guest, uh, Dato Kamil. Thank you for coming on board, sharing your love for the industry, uh, all of your wonderful insights and uh, the history that you bring, bring uh, to us to sh- share with us the context uh, of the Malaysian industry, where it is now and where it can be. And uh, thank you for inviting uh, Leon. Uh, Leon, thank you for joining us. You know, you've shared awesome. very valuable uh, insights and uh, really it's, it's good to hear from people who are actually on the ground uh, making things things work. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So, yeah. So hopefully uh, I'll be able to see, see uh, have uh, the both of you on again uh, sometime in the future. And oh. uh, to all of our guests who have uh, joined us live and who are watching this after uh, this live session on YouTube. Uh, yes. Do find this channel uh, on YouTube. It's uh, the Thinkers Lounge and uh, subscribe. Uh, I will post the, the video over there. And uh, just to share with all of you, uh, I do have a special guest that's coming on board uh, uh, on Tuesday, 9 p.m. His name is Samuel Isaiah. Right, yes. Samuel Isaiah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's the Malaysian teacher who made it for the final 10 for the US 1 million Global Teacher Prize yeah. 2020. Made, uh, yeah, he went viral because of Stephen Fry giving him a shout out. So, yep. yes, do join us uh, on a Tuesday, 9 p.m., same place. So, we should make a movie about him. <laughs> <laughs> certainly. A Malaysian certainly. movie, yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah. again, thank you, everyone. Great having all of you here tonight. Thanks, Have thank a you. good night. See you next thank time. You. Bye. 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 Bye.